Sam, Bears of Burden, Book 5 Written by Candace Ayers Narrated by R.J. Crichton Chapter 1 Presley My new landlord had evidently been grossly understating when she said the little house at the end of the lane was old. I stood outside of my new home, mouth agape, fighting tears. Everything the woman had told me had been a complete exaggeration. The charming cottage wasn't charming at all. It was a rundown, falling apart, older than dirt shack. Furthermore, I doubted very much that even in its better days, it had ever been a charming cottage. Was it my imagination, or did the whole structure lean to the left? I couldn't find a trace of the vintage appeal I had hoped for. The sweet little garden I'd been promised looked more like a threatening tangle of overgrown jungle. No, my landlord hadn't been exaggerating. She'd been outright lying. The white paint on the clapboard siding was peeling in large flakes, desperate to detach itself from the eyesore. The windows were covered with worn wooden shutters, missing more than half of their slots. The roof was tin, from the looks of it, and had rusted into that signature burnt orange hue that tin seemed to navigate towards over time. The front door, that may have once been white, was a dingy gray with large vertical cracks that did nothing to convince me of its sturdiness. I wasn't even sure it would be safe to approach the front as I studied the porch. The simple concrete slab had chunks of the edges falling off into the yard below. Two columns of crumbling brick tried with all their might to hold up the sagging porch. Not an easy task, to be sure, since each was missing several bricks. As I took a couple steps towards the dilapidated structure I was to call home, dry dirt swirled up from the driveway with each footfall. Shock was keeping me from venturing too far from my old rusty truck that I'd named Bessie. I peeked around the sides of the house, but saw nothing but the sweet little garden, a.k.a. nasty weed jungle. Wild, thorny brush consumed the area in dark greens and browns. It certainly was not the colorful flora garden I'd been expecting. I was terrified to go any further. I stood staring at my new home, my mind grasping for a solution. I'd already put down all the money I had as a deposit. I wasn't naive enough to think that the shrewd woman I dealt with was going to just hand me my cash back when I asked for it. There was nothing I could do. I had nowhere else to go. Up until a few weeks prior, my home had been Macon's Edge— the family home was a big, old, sprawling beast of a house that I'd shared with my parents and five sisters. It'd been overly cozy at times, but I'd liked the camaraderie I'd shared with my sisters, and I'd never known anything different. At the age of 27, I could admit that I was stunted. Macon's Edge did that to people, though. A small community of around 150 people it sat in the middle of nowhere between Burden and Dallas, Texas. Most people didn't even know it existed, and that's how the holier-than-thou Bible thumpers of Macon's Edge liked it, too. My bitterness aside, they were good people, if perhaps misguided. Religious to a fault, they liked to keep to themselves. A close-knit community shunning outsiders whose viewpoints and secular thinking might challenge the preachings of their beloved pastor, my father. I suppose I was born different from the others. Even from an early age, I'd always been one to question things. I tried to be good, to follow the holy path, but as hard as I tried, questions popped up that seemed to challenge the ultra-conservative doctrine embraced by my authoritarian father and his congregation, or flock, as they preferred to be called. The straw that broke the proverbial camel's back for me was Kyle Barnes, the man I thought was everything, my hero, my savior, my Prince Charming. My Prince Charming, it turned out, was nothing but a frog. It was a total nightmare, the whole sordid mess. Kyle was charming and handsome and the first man who made me feel worthy. 
I sort of knew that my family, under the strict rule of my father, would never accept Kyle unless he embraced our teachings and joined the flock. The way Kyle made me feel, though, I couldn't resist him. When he asked me to be his wife, I was so swept up in the romantic fantasy that, of course, I said yes, hoping and praying that somehow things would work out and either Kyle or my parents would give just an inch. Before that could happen, though, my world came crashing down around me. I'd learned that Kyle had been deceiving me, a sinister betrayal that had left me reeling. What was worse was that while I was suffering from the pain of Kyle's betrayal, Word of our engagement had spread to Macken's Edge. Who tattled on me or why, I would never know. But Father had been so enraged that when he confronted me, I thought he might actually send me to an early grave. He called me horrible names, a whore, a filthy slut, and told me that I was the daughter of Satan, hopelessly and eternally damned. I was banished from his God-fearing home, which essentially banished me from all of Macken's Edge. No one in his flock would take me in after Father labeled me a heathen and an apostate. So instead of being surrounded by my sisters and other members of the flock, I was standing alone in front of my new dwelling place that probably should have been condemned. Once again, feelings of shame and inadequacy washed over me. I was very aware that I had no meaningful life experience that I lacked street smarts, as some would say. I was afraid to walk up to the door and open it. What would I do if the house was uninhabitable? I had no clue how to survive on my own outside of Macken's Edge. I couldn't even take care of myself. Father's voice echoed through my mind, his words extolling what a worthless failure I was, a vain sinner who would come crawling back on her hands and knees begging forgiveness from those who had the strength unlike me, to look Satan in the eye and say no. Anger bubbled to life in me. I might be useless, but I didn't have to remain so. I desperately wanted to prove him wrong. I didn't need him. I didn't need Macken's edge. I could survive without the flock. I'd been trying to release myself from religious bondage for years, anyway, I just hadn't planned on it being so abruptly or with nothing but a couple hundred dollars in a bag I'd packed in under five minutes. All my life I'd been taught to swallow down any negative emotion, bury it. But right now I let anger fuel me. I marched through the dusty yard and up the squeaky stairs. I didn't stop until I was at the front door, my hand resting on the rusted doorknob. The cracks running through the door looked more severe close up. I turned the knob and pushed the door open. If the outside was a nightmare, the inside was Freddy Krueger. Even with the streams of sunlight beaming behind me, I couldn't make myself step inside. Cobwebs and musty shadows silently screamed for me to run for my life, and I wasn't so much of a rebel that I could refuse them. I turned and slammed the door shut behind me before racing down the dusty driveway to the haven of my Bessie. When I started her, the old girl rumbled and coughed, but she started before catching reverse and jerking backwards. Not knowing where to go, I headed back toward town. Even though I had nowhere else, I didn't think I could be brave enough to go into that house alone. I tried to hold back the tears, but one escaped. And once one escaped, the rest followed in a torrential cascade that quickly became gut-wrenching sobs. It was so bad. I was so out of control that I had to pull over on the side of the road. Bessie sputtered and shook violently before dying. Flopping my head dramatically down onto the steering wheel, I jumped as the horn blared. Scared and feeling more alone than I could ever remember feeling, I let myself bawl. It wasn't something that father had ever permitted. Ladies were raised to be sweet and supportive allowing her emotions to show labeled a woman selfish and sour. No man would accept a selfish, sour woman, nor should he. A woman's role, according to the pious Reverend Gray, was to compliment a man, not satisfy her own selfish desires. At home, I'd sucked it up and swallowed so many lumps in my throat over the years that there was probably a permanent section of my stomach chock full of emotional issues. 
things were happening so suddenly. Life had been on pause for the first 27 years of my life, and suddenly I had to go and push the play button. I had a lot to learn about how the world worked outside of Mackin's Edge. The real world. I'd had a crash course over the past weeks, including finding out my fiancé had been serial cheating on me throughout our courtship and engagement, followed by me foolishly being lured into a one-night stand with a stranger. I'd spent the last couple of weeks since being expelled from Matkins Edge holed up in a rent-by-the-week motel on the outskirts of Dallas. It was all that I could afford while looking for a place to rent. The things I'd seen were not things I would ever forget. I'd witness people using all varieties and manner of drugs in various ways and places on their bodies that I would have thought impossible if I hadn't seen it with my own eyes. There were people frequently having sex out in public, and strange sounds at night that I wasn't sure were pleasure or pain. I'd never been so eager to get out of Dallas and find a place I could call my own. I prayed for a place where I couldn't hear my neighbors trying to kill each other, and where I'd never again be chased by a man waving his penis at me from his wheelchair while offering to give me the ride of my life. A knock on my window made me scream, and I instinctively jerked away from it. Focusing through my tears, I saw a man bent over, peering in at me. He wiggled his fingers in a little wave and smiled. I held up my hands and shook my head. I have no money. Nothing of value. Please just leave me alone. His brow furrowed, and he shook his head. Roll down your window, ma'am. I'm not going to hurt you. I hesitated, feeling like I might be about to make another mistake. But I cranked the window down while leaning away from him. Ew. I hadn't meant to utter it aloud, but I also hadn't expected such a handsome man to be accompanied by the ripe stench of animal manure. He laughed, seemingly unoffended, and shrugged. I'm a veterinarian. The odors sometimes come with a job. So... Care to tell me what's so wrong that it made a pretty lady like you shed tears? Chapter 2 Presley I laughed a bitter laugh and wiped my teary eyes. What's so wrong? What isn't wrong? First of all, you're not going to show me your penis or try to kill me, are you? He grinned and stepped back. My, uh, penis will stay in my pants where it belongs, and I'm no killer. Come on out. The truck door creaked when I opened it, and the whole truck groaned when I stepped out, which was just insulting. I didn't weigh that much. I pushed the door shut. This is not a good day for me. The man just kept grinning. He had short, dark hair and a rough beard that was in need of a good trim, but he was absolutely gorgeous. Intelligent but kind eyes stared at me with laugh lines crinkling their edges. Straight white teeth and dimples just pushed him over the edge into model territory. Drug trouble? I shrugged. I don't know. She died, but sometimes she just needs a rest. I haven't even tried to restart her. I just needed to sit for a minute. I see. What's the problem? I took him in and crossed my arms over my chest. I'm not sure I should say. I mean, I don't know you. He held up his hands, palms facing up. I'm a nice guy. I saw you stranded and wanted to help, that's all. I chewed on my lower lip and gave in to my nature of trusting everyone and everything around me. It's a long story. Hmm... Well, I've got to run to another farm to check on a cow who's trying to give birth. How about you come with me? It's just up the road. A birth? I couldn't keep the awe out of my voice. Back at Mackin's Edge, one member of the flock had a few milk cows, but I'd never seen one give birth before. He nodded. A birth? I could use a hand if you want to come along. I nodded eagerly, craving the chance to forget about how stressed I was for just a little while. Sure, but if this is some kind of trick to get me into the woods alone with you, I'm warning you now that I know karate. I didn't. I would be hard-pressed to think of one thing to do to defend myself if he tried to overpower me. 
yet another way I was grossly unprepared for the real world. Consider me formally warned. I'm Dr. Matt Jennings, the local veterinarian here in Burden. Nice to meet you. I shook the hand he extended and gave him a shaky smile. Presley Gray. He gestured behind him to his shiny black Ford F-250 and walked toward it. Okay, start talking, Presley Gray. Tell me all of your woes. All of them. I quickly locked Bessie and hurried to catch up with him. I didn't think veterinarians counseled human patients. Matt opened the door for me and easily caught me around the waist and lifted me inside the big truck. I'm multi-talented. I frowned as he reached over and buckled me in. I must look like a pathetically helpless lost puppy, huh? He shook his head. No, you don't look pathetic. Your tears just got to me is all. I'm probably overdoing the whole Papa Bear thing, but we all need a helping hand once in a while. I laughed, surprising myself and shook my head. Come on, Papa Bear. Let's go see Mama Cow. As he walked around the truck, I pondered the insanity of what I was doing. I'd just gotten into a strange man's truck to head to an unknown location. Not a soul on earth knew where I was or what I was doing. All my life, I had been warned about the evils of who lived outside of Mackin's Edge, those outside the flock. I had been raised to think that they had no moral compass whatsoever. While I didn't truly believe that, Matt, the handsome veterinarian, could be a serial killer intent on dismembering me with a hacksaw and leaving my remains in the woods for wild animals to devour. I sighed. That would stink. Matt started the truck and glanced over at me. Start talking. If I was going to be dismembered and devoured, I might as well get things off my chest while I still could, I figured. I got kicked out of my home, spent time in a seedy motel in Dallas, and rented the first house here I could find. There are rental properties in Burden? I cast him a look. I think I found the one and only. I also found out why no one else had rented it. He winced. That bad, huh? Worse. Picture something from your childhood nightmares and age it by a hundred years. Is that why you're driving around with a packed duffel bag in the front seat? I nodded. The man was observant. It took me all day to find the place, and when I did, I was too frightened to go inside by myself. It's terrifying. The Wicked Witch who rented it to me told me how perfect it would be for a single woman. She described it as having a quaint, vintage cottage feel with a sweet garden. Ah, uh, the wool pulled over your eyes, did you? I groaned and blew out a breath, letting it vibrate my lips as I did it. Apparently that's my new thing. This is getting more and more interesting. I flashed him an exaggerated eye roll and then braced myself for the painful slap across my mouth. When no pain came, I looked over at Matt and did it again just to test it out. Why are you rolling your eyes at me? I feel like I'm missing something. I laughed out loud elated at the sudden feeling of freedom that overtook me. You're not mad that I rolled my eyes. He shook his head. Should I be? No. Gosh, maybe this day isn't going to be so bad after all. I looked down at his large hands and frowned. As long as you don't decide to murder and dismember me. Presley, I promise you that I will neither murder nor dismember you. I do need you to refrain from saying anything like that in front of anyone else, though. I don't need a rumor like that starting up in the town the size of Burden. Relaxing into the seat, I played with the ends of my hair and huffed out a breath. Thank you for helping me, Matt. Oh, you'll be paying me back. I have a feeling I might need help with this calf. The owner is pretty old and won't be able to assist the way I might need. I grinned. That's awesome. What kind of help? He looked over at me and quirked his eyebrow. The gross, messy kind that might involve lots of bovine bodily fluids. I thought about it for a second. Will there be gloves? There will be gloves. 
Do you need a permanent assistant? He jerked his gaze over to me before focusing on the road again. After a few more seconds' pause, he replied, Maybe. Matt, would you mind helping me move into my new house later? He laughed and shrugged. Why the hell not? I swallowed and giggled. Why the heck not? Chapter 3 Sam I strolled into the cave after a long shift at the station. Without time to shower, I knew I carried the scent of a long day of sweat and putrid smoke. My shoulders ached and I stretched my arms, needing to release some of the tension that had built up. Sam! Kelly Dyers ran up to me and jumped, throwing herself onto my body. She latched her arms around my neck and her legs around my waist as I stumbled backwards. Well, hey, Kelly. She touched my nose with the tip of her finger and grinned. You're smelly. I tried to feel something for the petite little blonde in my arms, but nothing. I was too exhausted. No amount of shifter strength was going to re-energize me until I had a good long sleep. A long day in the office. Did you save anyone's laugh today, Sammy? I was planted in the middle of the dance floor, standing still with a woman clinging to my body like I was a tree she was climbing. I moved to the side, my aching muscles protesting. Let's not talk shop. What are you doing here? She pouted. Come on, Sam. I want to hear about your day. I saw smoke over towards Big Bend. Was anyone hurt? Did you have to rescue anyone? My bear growled and I had to bite my tongue to keep the sound in. I didn't want to be mean to the woman, but I was in no mood to play firefighter with her tonight. I just wanted to grab a beer, get off my feet, and catch a few laughs with my buddies. Kelly, I've got some important business to discuss with Hutch and Thorn. Maybe I'll catch up with you later. A pout spread across her face, but she let go of me, slowly sliding down my body, still trying to lure me into her games. You'd better. I'll be waiting for you. She winked at me as she threw her hair behind her shoulder. I forced my body to the bar and waved to Allie, Thorne's mate. Can I get a keg of beer rolled out to me? She laughed. Now, Sam, why would you need to drown yourself on a Tuesday night? Because some of Wyatt's new wilderness nuts lit damn near half the mountain on fire today. She grinned and shook her head. It wasn't Georgia this time. I'll send something over to you. Go sit down. You look dead on your feet. I tapped the bar with my fingers and nodded. Thanks, Sally. Struggling to find energy, I lumbered over to our usual table where Thorn, Hutch, and Sterling were sitting watching me, with big grins. Thorn raised his eyebrows. You look like an 80-year-old man walking around here, Sam. I sighed as my ass hit the wooden chair, my back slouching into it. I feel like one. Fuck. I'm going to kill Wyatt the next time I see him. Sterling shrugged. That's cool. We don't need him. I laughed and instantly regretted it. Groaning, I wrapped my arm around my ribcage and shook my head. We don't heal fast enough. Allie appeared at my side with a pitcher of beer and a mug. This is just for Sam. He's earned it. Y'all leave him to it. Thorne reached out and grabbed the back of her shorts when she tried to hurry away. Dragging her back into his chest, he nuzzled her neck. You didn't bring me anything special? She swatted his arm, then pressed a chaste kiss to his mouth. That'll have to tide you over. Until later. I watched them and felt another ache. This one stemming from a deep inner longing. Casting a glance over at Kelly, I found her staring at me and quickly diverted my gaze back to my beer. Even loneliness wasn't going to give me enough energy to keep up with a wildcat like Kelly tonight. She always wanted to play firefighter games. I'd have to pretend to carry her from a burning building and then give her mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. 
Even the idea of it right now soured my stomach. I didn't want to have anything to do with fighting fires until I had to report in for my next shift. I looked up to find the guys all staring at me. What? Sterling rubbed at his eyes and blinked. Did I just see you cold shoulder, Kelly? Isn't she number one on your rotation of women who burn for firemen? I grunted. I'm too fucking tired tonight. I'm seconds away from asking one of you to just pour this beer down my throat for me. Hutch snickered and Thorn splashed the last of his beer in my face. I growled and wiped my face. You're an asshole. Oh yeah? What you gonna do about it? Wanna fight? I shook my head and managed a weak half-grin. I hate you. I hate all of you right now. I'm taking my picture and leaving. I just want to crawl into bed and sleep for the next three weeks. If anyone sees Wyatt, tell him I've got a boot waiting to shove up his ass when I see him. They waved me off, laughing when I spotted Kelly up front and abruptly changed direction, turning to head out the back door instead. Hutch squawked at me. Chicken. I flipped him off and took the second pitcher of beer Allie held out to me as I passed the bar. Planting a kiss to the top of her head, I thanked her. She was becoming a good friend to me, and a great mate to my buddy Thorn, and I was grateful for her. That didn't stop Thorn from growling at me. Hands off my mate. Allie rolled her eyes. Feel better, Sam. I left the bar and cut through the woods to walk to my house. I lived close to the bar in the middle of town. It wasn't my ideal choice, but I'd been far too busy working to focus on what I really wanted. Something further from town. A place with some land. I let myself in and plopped down on the couch. My arms shook from fatigue as I upturned the first pitcher of beer, draining it. I flipped on the TV, laid back, and tried to focus on the news. My eyes crossed pretty much right away, though, and I couldn't stay awake. I was out before I could even put the pitcher back on the table beside me. It rolled off my chest and hit the floor with a loud thud. But I was too far gone to care. Chapter 4 Presley It had been almost two weeks since I'd settled into the Burden house. Matt had taken me on as his assistant, even though I had no training and was sometimes terrified of the animals we worked with. He'd also helped me move in and checked under the bed and in the closet for ghosts and serial killers at my request, once every few days. He was amazing, and there was no weirdness between us at all. I was a little worried when we first started working together that things might become uncomfortable. He was very attractive, but I'd sworn off men for the foreseeable future. Fortunately, it didn't take long for me to learn that he wasn't interested in me in that way— nor any other woman, for that matter. The realization made me feel awkward. I'd blushed a lot in his presence and had a hard time silencing the echoing voice of Father's awful fire and brimstone sermons about homosexuals in my head. It wasn't that I thought he was right. I knew he was just spewing venom. My awkwardness stemmed from the fact that I was embarrassed to be related to someone who could say such awful, hateful things. I subconsciously worried that Matt might somehow see through me to my roots, to my upbringing, to the beliefs of the flock that I had grown up in, and hold it against me. I was flooded with guilt over the blood that ran through my veins. It only took a couple of days for me to feel so consumed with guilt that I told Matt everything. I knew that I was too open, too trusting, but Matt listened while I talked about my family. And when he saw me frowning, he would hug me and hold me to his chest until I pushed him away. We became fast friends after just a couple of weeks, and he never held any of my past against me. He'd taken me under his wing and had shown me how to do the simplest of things without judging me, like having the utilities turned on in my home. Time and again, when I felt like I'd just escaped from an underground cult, he only smiled and talked me through things. I was finally beginning to feel like an adult. Something I thought I'd longed for while secluded in Macon's Edge. 
but after experiencing the seedier side of Dallas, began to doubt. Thanks to Matt's patience, I now felt ready. Of course, I had little choice. My family had made no attempts to reach out to me, not even my sisters. Nothing. I'd sent them a card the first week I was in Dallas, hoping that maybe one or two might feel the same desire to escape the flock. I sent another once I had a permanent address. Still nothing. I suppose that was to be expected. Father was feared and revered in Mackin's Edge, but even more so in our home. Growing up, none of us girls dared cross him and face his wrath. I knew my older sisters were lost to the flock, but I thought that there might be a chance that Fran would come. She was a year younger than me and often questioned the teachings like I had. If I allowed my thoughts to stray to my family too often— it brought tears to my eyes, and I'd spend the rest of my day in a melancholy that was hard to get out of. It wasn't healthy, so when I wasn't at work, I busied myself instead with scouring my new dwelling. The house wasn't as scary once I'd cleared out the cobwebs, and Matt had helped me get the electric turned on. It did have a strange odor that never went away, but Matt bought me a few scented candles that hid it nicely. The walls were dingy and the floors were warped. But it was a roof over my head and for that I was grateful. Matt, being Matt, had offered up his guest room the moment he saw the place, but I refused. Despite my fears and tears, I had paid for the place and I needed to be stronger if I was going to make it in the world outside the flock. I was learning, slowly, to be an adult. I was learning, slowly, to be an adult. I'll bait an adult who had massive amounts of help from a good friend. I had, however, managed to stay in the house for the past four days without calling Matt over, so I felt proud of myself. I was doing it. After a dinner of a bologna sandwich and a bag of chips, I tucked in for the night. Bed was an old crib-sized mattress I'd placed in the small bedroom at the back of the house. I picked up the little mattress and a couple of old blankets at the local thrift store along with some mismatched cups, plates, and silverware. It worked for me for the time being. But I had stars in my eyes about the idea of getting real furniture one day. As I lay on my little mattress, I stared up at the ceiling and blinked away tears. It was my ritual to shed a few tears each night. But I was trying to do better. I didn't want to be sad. I wanted to be okay. I wanted to be normal. Normal people didn't cry themselves to sleep. My mind went to spastic overdrive every night, touching on all the things I was missing. My family was at the top of the list. I couldn't say I regretted leaving Mac and Zedge, but I would have done anything to see my sisters again. I missed the little things, like the walks we took down to the creek bed, and the camaraderie of all of us girls pitching in to fix supper, then wash up the dishes afterward. I realized, more and more reluctantly, that I even missed what Kyle had been in my life. Kyle had been the first and only man to call me pretty. He'd been my first kiss, my first everything. I'd even given my virginity to him. My chastity was something that I'd been taught to hold sacred. A woman should give herself to no man but her husband. And I had a hard time giving in to Kyle before our wedding. I realized in retrospect that Kyle had done a number on me. He convinced me that we were as good as husband and wife already, and that it was perfectly okay. It was such a unique and euphoric feeling to me to have a man desire me, or to see any value in me at all that I gave in. I had thought that Kyle was the love of my life. I trusted him. Finding out the reality of a relationship had devastated me. So much so that I'd done something reckless and foolish. I had so much to atone for. I fell asleep wondering if someday I would find the man I was meant to be with. I imagined it happening several years in the future, when I was more of a worldly-type woman. 
Currently, I felt like I was barely out of my teens, little more than a newborn calf that Matt and I had helped bring into the world, walking around on shaky legs. I was still learning, still growing. Maybe he was too. In the middle of a dream about parading around in burden, arm in arm with my sisters, I was startled awake by something unusual in my room. I jerked upright. It took a moment or two to wrap my head around what was happening. But when I did, panic instantly seized my heart. The room was hazy, but I could make out a bright light coming from the kitchen. The air was thick, and I began to cough. The haze quickly became dark, billowing clouds of smoke that stung my eyes and choked off my airway. Even through the thick smoke, the bright light from the kitchen was now clearly visible as the flames of raging fire. I stood up and hurried to the doorway. But crackling and popping sounds from the living room scared me. I backed away, coughing, my eyes stinging from the smoke. I looked around the bedroom for a way to escape. The only window in the room was small, but big enough for a person to fit through. I ran over and tried to pry it open. It was nailed shut. Why had I never noticed that before? I'd have to break it. I wrapped a blanket around my fist and punched the glass. A shooting pain traveled through my fist up my arm, but the window didn't even crack. Banging on it again and again, I prayed for it to break. I dropped the blanket and used my bare fist. The smoke burned my eyes and throat. Sweat drenched the t-shirt I wore. The fire was getting closer, growing stronger every second. The house was a matchbox, everything igniting whatever was beside it. Fear and smoke threatened to steal my last breath, but I fought with the window. I didn't have anything heavy in the room to use to break the glass, just the mattress and old blankets. I was going to die in a crappy little run-down shack in Burden. I was going to die. Chapter 5. Sam It felt like I just closed my eyes when the alarm on my phone went off. I knew immediately it was the firehouse. I sat up and jammed my feet into my shoes before taking off out my front door. Not bothering to lock the door, I jumped in my truck and raced over to the station. The captain was already gearing up along with a couple of the other firefighters, Dan and Pete. I jumped into the routine of donning my gear, rubbing the sleep from my eyes as I went. Did the mountain reignite? Captain Jones shook his head. The little shack at the end of Orange Blossom Lane is lit up like a damn fireworks show. One of the neighbors thinks there might be someone living in it. Says there's been an old truck parked in the driveway for a few weeks now. My stomach tightened to a knot the way it always did when learning about a potential fire victim. I tugged my helmet on before running to the fire truck. Come on. I'd gone from being in a dead sleep to maneuvering a speeding fire truck towards a small dirt lane where, in less than five minutes, an inferno blazed. I knew it may still have been too long. We could be rushing towards a burning house fire that held the remains of its victim. When I turned onto the little street, my heart sped, and adrenaline surged, charging my brain which in turn kick-started my muscles. Everything working on autopilot, doing what it had been trained to do. I spotted the fire. The small structure was burning high and bright. This one wasn't going to be easily doused. Once we had it under control, I knew we'd be left with nothing but a smoldering pile of ashes. I parked the fire truck close to the house beside a rusty Chevy that'd seen better days. Jumping out and running for the hose, I quickly hooked it to the closest fire hydrant and handed it off to Pete. I'm going to look around and see if I can spot anyone through the windows. Start working on the front. See if you can clear us a way in. I hurried around the house, trying as best I could to see in the smoke-filled structure. I'd nearly made my way around it completely when I noticed a hand pressed against a window. It was a small hand. Small and delicate. Female. 
My heart pounded harder. She was still alive, and I was determined to keep her that way. It'd be a good story to tell if she was okay. The little fire bunnies like Kelly would love it. I peered into the window to assess the situation. There was so much thick smoke that I couldn't see the rest of the woman. Knowing that she probably didn't have much time left, I turned my body and slammed my elbow through the glass. Smoke billowed out, and the fire in the front burned brighter, fed with the additional oxygen. The whole place was going to go in seconds. I only needed to lean my body over the sill to find the woman hunched and propped against the wall under the window, trembling. She looked up at me with the biggest, most beautiful eyes I'd ever seen. Mate. I was momentarily stunned, but my bear came to life and growled again. Mate. Shit. Swinging into action, I reached down and grabbed her, yanking her out of the burning house. Holding her tightly to my chest, I carried her farther from the smoke and fire. She coughed and rubbed at her eyes. Her pouty lower lip quivered. Again, I was stunned stupid. My bear was shouting at me to claim our mate now that we had finally found her. Mark her. Don't let her go. Fortunately, I overrode my animal instincts and forcibly kicked my training into high gear. Is there anyone else in the house? She shook her head, and her long, pale, blonde hair tumbled down my arms and brushed against my legs. I could almost feel the silky caress through my suit. I carried her around to the front of the house and nodded to Captain Jones. I had her. What's your name, Rapunzel? Her eyes widened even further, and she started crying. Presley, my house... I looked back at the crew. They had everything under control. I wasn't letting go of the woman in my arms. Yeah, it's gone. We'll find somewhere else for you to live. Like with me and my house. While some would think that insane, it felt perfectly normal to me. After so many years, I'd finally found my mate. Keeping her near me every second felt right. Are you okay? Does anything hurt? How could I have forgotten to ask her that immediately? She shook her head and her hands clung to my shoulders. I is everything destroyed? Maybe it doesn't matter. We'll make sure you're taken care of. A house, new stuff, whatever you need. She met my eyes and I watched her throat work as she swallowed audibly. Over the smell of the smoke clinging to her, I caught the faintest whiff of her arousal. My dick reacted in epic proportions, and I had to rearrange myself to ease the ache. I grasped her tighter to my chest. Does anything hurt? I repeated the question, trying to get myself under control. She bit her lip and looked down. Gently, she moved her hands from my shoulders and lifted her knuckles for my inspection. I couldn't break the glass. I wasn't strong enough. Sensing she was on the verge of tears, I flexed my arms and winked. Not everyone has these guns. She ducked her head and looked up at me through long lashes. Instead of speaking, she just chewed on her lip and watched me, studying me. I had to resist the urge to puff out my chest, hoping her perusal of my looks was leaving a favorable impression. I couldn't tell if she was shy or just in shock from the fire. I'd figure her out. We had all the time in the world to get to know each other. How's your breathing now? Do you need oxygen? Her small but perky chest rubbed against me as she tested her breathing. As her nipples stroked my uniform through the thin, oversized t-shirt she was wearing, I heard her small intake of air. I scented her arousal growing stronger. Fine. My captain shot me a look when he saw how I was holding Presley. I just held her tighter and shrugged. I'd explain it to him later. An ambulance showed up and an EMT hurried over to us with a medical bag at his side. He reached down to touch Presley and fury washed over me. I growled at him low in the back of my throat and bared my teeth. Don't touch her. 
He froze, very much human, and raised his hands. I'm sorry. I assumed she was the victim. She is. I need to check her over. My bear had never been violent. I'd brawled with my friends over the years and had a few ill-thought-out fistfights after a night of drinking when I was younger. But the reaction my bear was having to the EMT was shocking. He wanted to rip the man's head off. I couldn't control the rage that blurred my vision. Touch her and I'll break your fucking hand. Captain Jones rushed over and put his hand on the EMT's shoulder. Son, what's the problem? I pressed my little mate's head to my chest and tangled my hand in her ridiculously long hair. Mine. Presley, if she thought what was happening was bizarre, didn't say anything. She just let me hold her while I threatened and growled. Shit. Why don't we let the paramedic check her out, Sam? We need to make sure she's okay. He wanted to take my mate away from me. I snarled at him seconds away from going feral when a familiar scent reached me. My cousin, Matt Jennings, the calmest guy I knew, was rushing towards us not looking too calm at all. Chapter 6 Presley I had no clue what weird science was happening between myself and the devastatingly sexy fireman holding me. But I knew. Like I knew that the night sky was black and the morning grass was green. That he was as attracted to me as I was to him. My body had instantly and tenaciously reacted to his. The moment I saw him through the window, I had felt something inside me transform— like the first breath of fresh air after he'd lifted me through the window. He felt life-affirming. Somehow it felt normal that seconds after escaping a perilous blaze that almost consumed me, my body was responding with wanton lust to the firefighter holding me firmly and lovingly to his chest. He held me as though he was carrying me across the threshold on our wedding night. My body had never responded to anyone anyone at all, the way it was responding to him. I could feel moisture pooling in my panties, making my thighs slippery. I was painfully aware that if I wrapped my legs around him, I'd be able to rub myself against the hard bulge I knew was in his uniform. Heat flooded my face, feeling hotter than the fire itself. What was wrong with me? I'd never wanted a man like I wanted him. I drank in his face, partially hidden by his helmet. Dark blue eyes, and I was close enough to see the specks of silver in them, surrounded by dark, thick eyelashes that I wanted to feel brushing against my skin. His mouth looked soft, and I desperately wanted to touch my lips to his to find out. His double would tickle, and I instinctively knew that I would love it. Pulses of raw desire flooded my body, and... Over a few seconds, I forgot everything about my past and my history with men. I envisioned giving myself to the man holding me in his strong arms, begging him to take me, crying out for him, and continuing over and over again until morning. He gruffly warned the paramedic against touching me, and I'd been glad. I didn't want him to release me, and I certainly couldn't stomach the thought of any other man's hands on me. It was as though time stood still between us. A sexy, growly thing he did from the back of his throat set my insides aflutter. If he just slide his hand between my legs, just a slight touch, it would bring me instantly to that magical point. As he called me his, like I was the last piece of pie at Thanksgiving dinner, my body flooded with even more moisture at my core. I liked it. I had no idea why, but heaven help me, I did. Then, like a switch had been thrown, he broke eye contact. I followed his gaze to see Matt running towards us, fear and worry etched in his face. The fog lifted. Seeing Matt jerked me back to reality. What in the world was I doing? Fear and panic washed away my arousal, and I wiggled out of the fireman's grip. 
running to Matt, I threw myself into his hug and sobbed. As soon as Matt's caring arms wrapped around me, I let the floodgates open. My body trembled and my knees felt like jelly. My mind and body suddenly reacted in spades to what had just occurred. First, the near-fatal experience of being trapped in the fire. Then, my almost as frightening, freakish reaction to the stranger who had rescued me. I could feel the firefighter's eyes boring into my back, and I clung tighter to Matt. The physiological response I'd had to him terrified me. I'd never felt anything like it before. And it terrified me. I'd never reacted to Kyle this way, and I'd thought I'd loved him. Kyle had devastated me. I could only imagine how deeply the destruction would run if I were to give myself to this handsome, powerful stranger only to have him trample on my still healing heart. Matt stroked my back. Are you okay? Sweetheart, you're shivering. What happened? I could hear the firefighter growling behind me and I squeezed Matt even tighter. I woke up and the house was on fire. I don't know if I left one of the candles burning or not. I was so scared, Matt. He lifted me into his arms and pressed a kiss to my head. You're coming home with me. I won't take no for an answer. You have to now. Matt? The stranger's voice threatened to weaken my determination, all deep and sexy. Hey, Sam. Thanks for saving my girl here. Your girl. Displeasure was evident in his voice, and I felt him move closer. Matt just helped me out more than he realized by calling me his girl. Maybe I could use that to my advantage before Matt corrected Sam. The stranger. It was a crazy idea, but it could work. Panic caused a rise of fight or flight within me, and I was flying as far away from Sam the firefighter as possible. Pretending to be in a committed relationship was far flying. Yes, I'm his girlfriend. I pulled my face back far enough to stare imploringly into Matt's eyes. It was clear he sensed my desperation, and a small furrow formed between his eyebrows. Uh, yep. So, yes, I really owe you one, cousin. Cousin? I dropped my head onto Matt's shoulder and groaned. I'd just coaxed Matt into lying to his cousin. Worse, what if his cousin knew he was gay? I held my breath and waited for the laughter, but none came. Didn't realize you were dating anyone. You know how it is, Sam. One second you're enjoying bachelorhood, and the very next second you're dating someone. Literally, the very next second. I pinched his arm and coughed to cover up his pained cry. Tingles spread across my skin as Sam's hand rested on my back. You sure you're okay? You're coughing. Do you need to get checked out? Sure, when someone else was holding me, he was okay with me getting checked out. No, I'm good, thank you. Is it okay if I take her home? I'll be sure to monitor her condition. If any symptoms present, I promise I'll get her taken care of. Matt's voice suddenly sounded strained, and for the first time since meeting him, I worried that he was angry with me. Sam grunted. She'll be at your house? Yes. Okay. Keep an eye on her, Matt. Matt agreed and then hurried me back towards his truck. He plopped me into the passenger seat and rushed around to the driver's side. Put your seatbelt on. I did as he said and frowned at him. You're mad at me. He backed down the dusty driveway and turned, heading the truck towards his house. Yeah, I am. You just made me lie to my cousin. Want to explain to me why? I swallowed and faced the road. It was dark, and I could just make out the few feet ahead that the headlights illuminated. I can't. The hell you can't. Sam's a good guy, and I don't like lying. Why did I just pretend to be your boyfriend? Or do you... You don't think we're together, do you? My face burned, and I jerked around to face him. No! Jeez, you don't really think I think we're together, do you? He sighed. I guess not. 
but what the hell is going on? Did he hit on you or something? I know Sam's a bit of a man slut, but as far as I know, he's always been a dedicated professional while working. Sam was a slut? Why did that revelation make me want to rake my fingernails down his face? I blew out a rough breath and shook my head at myself. I wasn't the violent type. At all. He didn't hit on me. There was just... something there. It freaked me out. Something there. Something... I don't know. It must have just been the fire. It really scared me. We're going to talk about this tomorrow morning. I got a strange vibe from Sam back there that there was something going on between the two of you. I want to know what exactly you've just gotten me into. I nodded. But I had no clue what I'd just gotten him into. I had no clue what the feelings were that were burning, not unlike that death trap of a house, between us. I just needed to keep my head down and avoid him. I'd lived in Burden for two weeks now, and this was the first I'd seen of the man. So avoiding him couldn't be that difficult, could it? Chapter 7 Sam My mate was dating my cousin. As much as it made my bear want to rip Matt's head off his neck, the man in me respected and loved my cousin. Matt was family, but he was also a good man. He never dated. In fact, I don't remember ever seeing Matt with a woman before. Yet somehow, he'd managed to find and fall for the most beautiful woman in all of Texas. How ironic that the first woman I'd ever seen him with was the woman that should belong to me. I didn't even know how to handle this. What should I do? On one hand, I'd been waiting to find my mate for a long time, and I was more than ready. On the other hand, I didn't want to disrespect Matt. Could I just sit around and wait on their romance to fizzle out, though? At the thought of them together romantically, I sat up and released a loud, growling roar. I shook my head hard to clear the images away and went outside to shift. My bear felt a little better, being free to roam, but still I found myself lifting my head, searching for the scent of our mate. Of course, I didn't have to try to find her. I knew where she was. At Matt's house, probably in Matt's bed, my bear started to lumber in that direction, planning to retrieve his mate. But I put the brakes on that idea. I wasn't going to win her over by being a raging bear asshole. I had to figure out some other way, some way that wouldn't hurt Matt. Instead of being all cave bear, I headed towards the creek. At any time of day, the little section of creek where I was headed was usually secluded. Trampling through the swollen waters, I found my little spot empty, as expected. I splashed into the water and found a shallow area to lay in, resting my head on a rock. I stretched out and let the water run over my fur, soothing me. Maybe I could come up with a plan to steal my mate. I loved Matt like a brother, but Presley was meant for me. I'd felt her reaction, smelled it. She wanted me as much as I wanted her. Besides, Matt deserved to be with someone who was made for him. I didn't love the idea of stealing her away from him, but I had to do something. It would eat me alive night after night to know that she'd be spending each one in the arms of another man. The thought was unbearable. My bear had gone feral for the first time in my life earlier in the night, had the idea of an EMT touching her. I didn't want to push my bear to a breaking point. That could get dangerous. Presley had seemed alarmed and frightened of her reaction to me, and I'd been confused by that response at first. But seeing her with Matt made sense. She didn't want to have strong feelings for someone else when she was committed to Matt. I couldn't give her the reprieve she wanted, though. She wasn't going to stop wanting me, and I wasn't going to stop wanting her. 
Meeting me had altered her life just as surely as meeting her had altered mine. It was how soulmates worked. I had already decided to visit her and Matt first thing in the morning before I reported to Wyatt's fucking mess. I wanted to stop by and check on her, make sure she was safe and looked after. My bear hadn't been much pleased to relinquish her to Matt's care, but I hadn't had a choice. The human norms had to be followed for my little human mate. I wouldn't scare her. I could, however, insert myself into her life to get her comfortable with me. A part of me felt like shit for plotting to steal Matt's girlfriend from him. Another part of me knew that he would understand when I told him that she was my mate. After the sun came up, I went back home and showered before heading over to Matt's. I thought about the last time I'd been out to visit him and felt even more guilt. I couldn't remember how long it'd been since I'd made an effort to visit. And here I was, coming to see him, but only for an ulterior motive. His dog, a huge mutt named Mabel, ran out of the near-human-sized dog door and made a beeline for me. She jumped up, planting her paws on my chest, and licked my face. I couldn't help but laugh and scratch behind her ears. She panted and slobbered, and her tail threatened to wag right off her overgrown body. Some guard dog, Matt laughed as he came out with a mug of coffee in his hands. What's up, Sam? Slivers of guilt inched their way deeper under my skin, and I squatted to stroke Mabel. Just stopped by to see how Presley was doing this morning. She was pretty shaken up last night. I was worried. He took a long drink of his coffee and raised his eyebrow. You. Worried. I wasn't sure you possessed that emotion, Sam. I rolled my eyes. Yeah, well, here I am. She's in the shower. I'll tell her you stopped by. The image of Presley standing naked under the shower head, droplets of water clinging to her pale, perky breasts instantly had my dick rock hard. I bit back a groan and saw the flicker of a curtain in one of the windows at the side of the house. She was watching. My little mate was watching. I'm about to head up to the mountain. We got most of the fire out yesterday, but we're out around the clock keeping an eye on it for the next couple of days to make sure nothing reignites. He glanced to his left, sensing the movement as well, and grinned. Have a cup of coffee before you go? I wanted to say no. I didn't need to see the two of them playing house in Matt's home, cozying up like a loving couple. I couldn't even imagine how my bear would react if she was wearing his clothes, smelling like him. Sure, thanks. It's going to be another long day. He led the way inside and had to grip the door to keep from being knocked over by Mabel's large body charging past him. A second later, a squeal came from the back of the house. Then Mabel returned, dragging a damp towel. Matt threw his head back and laughed while I had to remind myself that running into the back bathroom to catch a glimpse might be considered creepy. God, I love that dog. I looked over at Matt and shook my head. You train her to do that shit? He grinned. Nope. I rescued her from a frat house. While I managed to get her to stop eating underwear and harassing the neighbors when they barbecued, I couldn't break her of the towel thing. I couldn't help but laugh. The dog was beautiful and as sweet-tempered as could be. It wasn't the first time that she gave me an urge to take home one of Matt's mutts from his office. He had a ragtag collection of dogs that he'd found and taken in on the property at the back of his veterinary clinic. I wish I had more time at home. I'd take a dog like her any day. Matt shrugged. Why don't you come by the clinic when you've got a few minutes? I'm up to my ears in work and Presley tries to give them all enough attention, but I'm afraid she's going to wear herself thin. My ears perked up. Presley's working for you? Yeah, she is my assistant but she works her ass off making sure the rescued animals are getting everything they need and more. If I'm not careful, I think she'll adopt them all herself. She was kind then. I hated that I was learning about my mate from another man. 
but I had to take what I could get. Her softer voice called from the back of the house. Matt, I need some help. I gritted my teeth and watched him go, fighting hard to keep my bear in check. I couldn't stick around and watch them together, after all. I'd just have to figure out some other plan. Chapter 8 Presley I peered around the edge of the door at Matt, scowling. I need another towel. Why don't you keep towels in here? He laughed and shrugged. No storage space. Hang on, I'll get you one. I waited as he walked away and tried to peek down the hallway to see if Sam was nearby. Unlike any normal person who'd been through what I had, I didn't have nightmares of fire. No, my dreams had been plagued the entire night through by one hot fireman. The things my subconscious mind had cooked up starring sexy Sam weren't even remotely close to normal. Sam? Matt's voice called out as I heard a truck start outside. I shut the door and hurried over to the window. I pulled the curtain aside and watched as Sam's truck turned around and left. Tendrils of disappointment snaked through me, even as I told myself it was for the best. Sam stopped by to check on you, but he left. Which is just as well, because you and I have some things to discuss about last night. Matt opened the door a crack and shoved a towel inside with his hand over his eyes. Hurry up and get dressed. I'll make us some breakfast. I reached for the towel and did as he asked. I dried off and then hurried to the guest room to drag on the same clothes I'd worn to bed the night before. Matt had washed them for me, so they were clean and didn't stink of smoke. But the oversized t-shirt and shorts wouldn't last me long. I had a little money saved from the work at the vet clinic, but I intended to give that to Matt for graciously letting me stay with him. I closed my eyes and took a moment to allow the panic to wash over me. While growing up in the flock, we were taught as women to bury our feelings and emotions. Stuff them deep down and don't let them surface. Always be sweet. I'd learned when I was younger that it was better to go through them than try to bury them. Ignoring things didn't work for me. Of course, I couldn't let anyone know, but I'd developed my own coping technique. I had a little money saved from work at the vet clinic, but I intended to give that to Matt for graciously letting me stay with him. I closed my eyes and took a moment to allow the panic to wash over me. While growing up in the flock, we were taught as women to bury our feelings and emotions. Stuff them down deep and don't let them surface. Always be sweet. I learned when I was younger that it was better to go through them than try to bury them. Ignoring things didn't work for me. Of course, I couldn't let anyone know, but I developed my own coping technique. I embraced the panic and visually pictured strings attached to it, leading back to what was causing it. My thoughts raced to Sam, then veered to Father. I couldn't help but think about his reactions to my choices. I knew he would be appalled by my wanton and lustful reaction to Sam, and it was hard not to feel his disapproval like a backhand to the face. With no money to replace my clothing, I would need to return to Mackin's Edge and retrieve the last of my things. I'd only been away for a few weeks, but I felt as though I had already changed so much. I knew Father would notice. He would see that I had become more worldly, a sin against his teachings. It scared me and angered me at the same time. I wanted to be able to live my life, but his shadow was far-reaching. Matt knocked at the door. Food's ready. You coming? I opened the door and looked up at him. I could use a hug. He pulled me into his arms and held me tight to his chest. Poor thing. Let me feed you and then we'll talk. You can cry if you want. I pulled away and smiled at his generosity. I'd rather not. I'm trying to leave that part of me behind. The part that cries? I nodded. I want to be tough and street smart. I'd say independent, but that bus drove off the cliff last night. 
You'll figure something out. Don't worry so much right now. Let's just tackle one thing at a time. Right now, it's breakfast. He pressed a kiss to my hair and grinned. Then we'll tackle the next question. Why is Sam sniffing around you even though he thinks we're a couple? My face burned. He's not sniffing around me. I know sniffing when I see it. My cousin is sniffing. I sat at the table in front of the plate that Matt had already prepared for me. I shrugged. I didn't know why Sam had come over. Probably to visit his cousin. It couldn't be for me. He thought I was Matt's girlfriend. I'd handled that situation. Hadn't I? Matt let me eat in silence. I took small bites of my food, stretching it out, trying to find the words to explain to him why I'd made him lie to his cousin the night before. I couldn't say that I was a chicken and had felt so sexually charged by his cousin that I'd leaped at a chance to hide from that feeling. I couldn't say that I'd been seconds from humping his cousin like a dog, so I'd jumped at him instead. I couldn't say that my heart raced every single time I thought of Sam. I couldn't say that I thought the feelings would fade overnight after the stress of the fire faded. But they hadn't. So by the time I finished my last bite of food, I had a long list of things I couldn't say, and nothing to say that made any sense. I rubbed my stomach and pushed my plate away. That was really good, Matt. Thank you. He sat with his chin in his hand and a bored look on his face. You ready to talk yet? I swallowed my negative reply. I owed Matt everything. At the very least, an answer for why I'd made him lie. When I opened my mouth to talk, though, a knock sounded at the front door. Matt jumped and then frowned. We will be having this conversation, Presley. I can't believe I didn't hear anyone coming. I grabbed our plates and started doing the dishes while he and Mabel went to see who'd come by. Loud female voices echoed through the house, and I heard Matt say I was in the kitchen. I turned and dried my hands on a dish towel just as several women rushed me. I recognized them from town. Among them, Ophelia Barnes. My face blanched and my shame made itself known like an old friend slinging its arm over my shoulder. Ophelia was dating Sterling, one of the only two men that I'd slept with in my entire life. After finding out that Kyle had been cheating on me for the duration of our relationship, I'd been broken, shattered. I, of course, had to hide my pain at his betrayal from my family and the flock. But it was less than 24 hours before Father found out and brought his wrath down on me with a vengeance. He beat me and tossed me out of our family home, telling me he never wanted to see me again. At least not while I was still standing on two feet. Having just been brutally tossed aside not only by my fiancé but by my own family, I was so hurt and angry that, instead of being the good girl father had tried to raise, I'd rebelled. I headed to Burden and, for the first time in my life, set foot in a bar. If that wasn't heathen enough, I ordered myself a cocktail. Although I'd only drunk half of it, I was feeling a whole lot better. And when a handsome man began showering me with attention, I didn't try to stop him. I know it was wrong. I knew it was wrong then, too. But something inside me so strongly craved kind, caring attention in any form. That before I knew it, we'd ended up in bed together. His name was Sterling, and our night together hadn't meant anything to either of us outside of drowning us both in shame and guilt. Apparently nothing was a secret in Burden, because Kyle found out the very next day and told anyone who would listen that I'd cheated on him and broken his heart. Ophelia and I had known each other over the span of months that Kyle and I had been courting, but she worked in Nashville, and I only ever left Mackins educationally. As far as I knew, we'd both had a fondness for one another, being the two women in Kyle's life. That ended when I had not only hurt her brother, but slept with Sterling, the guy that she later turned out to be madly in love with. 
It was a small world, and I'd dipped my toes into one too many ponds to be able to stand tall in front of her. Chapter 9 Presley I wrapped my arms around myself and tried to smile at Ophelia, but it felt forced. Hi. She sent me a warm smile and a little wave. Hey. We heard about your house. Are you okay? I nodded, trying to find my voice. The one I'd been developing since leaving home. Yeah, I'm okay. It was scary, but I'm unscathed. Not even a scratch. Another woman, who introduced herself as Georgia, stepped forward and wrapped her arms around me. She squeezed and then sniffed my hair. You smell like a hippie. What kind of shampoo and conditioner did Matt give you? Matt grunted. It's a lavender and patchouli blend. Nothing wrong with it, either. Ophelia giggled and held out a bag to me. Sam called Allie and she called all of us. He was worried you wouldn't have clothes after the fire. Of course, he didn't think about all the other stuff that you'd need, like conditioner. Your hair is so long and lovely. We all got together extra stuff that we could part with. Tears filled my eyes, and I knew there was no way I could avoid crying in front of these women. I turned to face the sink and gripped it hard while trying to quiet the sniffling. My heart ached in my chest, and there was a lump lodged in my throat. I didn't feel like I deserved Ophelia's kindness. How was she even looking at me and not seeing the worthless hussy I saw in my head? Even though her brother had cruelly betrayed me, I'd still done something horribly wrong. I'd slept with her boyfriend. Well, her future boyfriend. I wanted the ground to open and swallow me whole. Matt's arm wrapped around me and he scowled. Look what you did. You made her cry. I waved my hand at him. They didn't do anything, Matt. You're crying, sweetheart. Ophelia snorted. Matt, we cry when we're happy, too. Now go on. We're going to take care of her. I waved my hands more and turned to them. Veronica, the librarian, stepped forward. She wiped the tears on my cheeks and shook her head. It's okay. I cried harder. I don't deserve this. Matt pulled me into his chest again. Sweetheart, what's going on with you? Ophelia tugged me away from him and to her side. Go, Matt. We know what we're doing. Presley and I are going to have a chat. Just the two of us. Trust us, we'll get her changed and dolled up good as new. I found myself being pulled into the guest room. Ophelia spun around to ask me something, but she turned faster than I'd expected, causing me to flinch and duck away. Her face fell, and she slowly and gently took my hands. Presley... What's going on? Did you think I was going to hit you? I tried to shake my head, but her eyes boring into mine made it impossible to lie to her. I had thought she was going to hit me. Suddenly frustrated with myself and the weakness that I couldn't seem to shed, I stepped away from her towards the window. I would deserve that, Ophelia. How you can even look at me after everything, I'll never know. She frowned. We already talked about that stuff, Presley. I know all about what happened with Kyle. I'm not mad at you. Not at all. I'm disgusted with my brother for what he did, but you're innocent. We had talked, true. But our conversation hadn't done much to squelch my guilt. I don't feel innocent. And wasn't that just the kicker? Somehow, while simultaneously feeling like a child who couldn't take care of herself, I also felt like a shameless trollop who'd carelessly hurt people just because she was hurting. Ophelia grabbed my arms again and gently shook me. You're innocent. Well, I don't love the fact that you slept with my mi- Boyfriend? He wasn't my boyfriend at the time. I also know that neither of you would entertain any such thoughts now. Kyle was awful to you. Of course you were in pain and looking for a kind shoulder. Not your fault. If anything, I should go punch Sterling for it. It seems he just took advantage of you. I didn't know what to say or how to respond. 
There were several seconds of silence where neither of us said a word. Then Ophelia spoke softly. What did they do to you out there in Mackin's Edge, Presley? I met her eyes and pulled myself up straighter. I wouldn't fall apart. If I fell apart, they'd all know, and there'd be nothing left. No home, no stuff. If there was no solid me, I felt like I'd cease to exist. I lifted my chin. Nothing that I couldn't handle. She wrapped her arms around me and hugged me. There she is. That's the badass I want to see. No more meek, fraidy cat Presley. You, my friend, are a badass. I don't know what you lived throughout there, but I get the impression that it wasn't all rainbows and unicorns. You made it through that. And you can make it through this, okay? I blinked back the emotion and nodded. Good. Keep that spine straight. Georgia will eat you alive if you're not strong. Hey, I heard that. Georgia called through the door. No longer hiding her eavesdropping. She pushed inside the room and frowned. I won't eat you alive. We're going to have a girl's day today and talk. I feel like I'm out of the loop on a lot of stuff here, and y'all know how I hate to be uninformed. Matt stepped in and smiled at me. Take today off, Presley. You and I can talk later. Allie popped her head in. Are you two dating? Sam didn't mention that. By the way, he sounded, I actually thought that he was interested in Presley. My cheeks heated and I felt myself slumping towards the bed. Things were a mess. Ophelia pressed her hand to my back. Nuh-uh. Straighten your back. No hiding. Veronica, the librarian, turned a puzzled gaze to Matt and frowned. You're not dating, are you? I groaned and threw myself on top of the bed. This is crazy. Matt cleared his throat. Yeah, we're, uh, dating. Are you sure? I looked at Veronica, and by the way she was eyeing Matt, I knew she knew he was gay. I quickly realized that made sense. She had to know, because the way I had found out was by stumbling upon the book he was reading. It was a gay love story checked out of the Burden Public Library. I threw up my hands in a gesture of surrender. No, I lied. We're not dating. We're just friends. When they all just quietly stared, watching me, I let out a long, frustrated breath. I sat up and ran my hands through my hair. Tugging lightly, I made an unhappy face. Scowling felt good, so I kept doing it. I lied because Sam was holding me and things were happening. It was too much, too intense. I couldn't handle it. I'm a big chicken, and I had never felt such overwhelmingly sexual feelings. Nothing like that. So I lied. Worse, I made Matt lie, and I feel terrible. Matt quirked an eyebrow. You don't look like you feel terrible. I realized I was still scowling and had crossed my arms. A laugh bubbled up from my stomach, and I didn't keep it down. The sound was ridiculous, but I couldn't stop, and more laughter bubbled up. Who knew confession could feel so good? I don't feel terrible right now. I probably will later, but right now, I just feel like doing something crazy, something fun. Matt frowned. She's snapped. Ophelia shook her head and laughed with me. No, she's emerging from her shell. Come on, let's go crazy. Chapter 10 Sam I sat at our usual table at the cave after a long day and watched Kyle Barnes across the dance floor. How he had the nerve to come back into a shifter-owned bar after the things he'd said about shifters during a fight with Sterling was beyond me. That wasn't even my biggest issue with the asshole anymore. I'd found out from Mally that Presley Gray was Kyle's ex fiance my mate had been engaged to the shithead standing across the bar with his pool stick, looking smug about getting a ball in the corner pocket. 
The fact that that creep had touched her made me want to snap his weak little backbone in half. What's going on with you? You look like you want to snap Kyle Barnes in half like a twig. Not that I don't agree, but brother, you're putting some extra heat in that glare. Hutch looked at me and then over at Kyle. On second thought, maybe you should just break the asshole. I growled. He was engaged to Presley. Presley? Matt's girlfriend? I growled louder, drawing eyes to our table, but not giving a fuck. My mate. Hutch froze for several seconds before emitting a low whistle and sitting back in his chair. Son of a bitch. Sterling joined us, spinning the chair next to me and straddling it backwards. He raised his eyebrows when I turned to glare at him. What? I would like nothing more than to put you and Kyle in a room and beat the living shit out of you both right now. Hatch whistled again. This just keeps getting better. What the hell did I do? Presley, gray, that's what you did. She's my mate. His face paled. What? Thorne dropped into his chair and looked around. Say again? She's mine and you touched her. Thinking about it was eating me alive. I felt like killing someone. Wait, you found your mate? What the? When the? I really missed something. Can we back up here? Sterling's face burned and he slowly folded his hands together on the tabletop and met my eyes. Dude, I didn't know she was your mate. That was a lifetime ago, I promise. Who's your mate? I ignored Thorn. You don't understand the fury coursing through me right now. Presley Gray, Matt's girlfriend, Kyle Barnes's ex fiance, Sam's mate. I tossed a glare at Hutch. Thorne joined Hutch in the whistling game. Shit, man. She's the girl that made Ophelia hate on you for a while, right, Sterling? I swiped my arm across the table, knocking everything to the floor. I stood up and planted my hands on the tabletop while leaning over it, getting closer to Sterling. She's my mate. The rest of it doesn't matter. Don't talk about her. Don't look at her. Don't fucking think about her. Sterling gritted his teeth. I'm not. I don't. You know I made it, right, Sam? I'm not a threat. That's not what my bear says. Come on, Sam. Calm down. Fuck you. Would you be calm if one of us had fucked your mate? Thorne growled. Don't even fucking say that. I straightened and shook my head. I don't want to look at you right now. Sterling stood up and grabbed my arm. You need to realize that I'm a brother. I didn't intend to hurt you. It was an accident. Stop touching me, Sterling. I'm not in the mood. No, this isn't happening. Fight it out with me. I shoved him away from me. I don't think that's safe for you right now. Thorne stood up and caught Sterling before he could shove me back. I don't think this is the time, Sterling. He's not ready. No, it's perfect. If he wants to fight me over a woman that is dating his cousin, fine. We can do that. I growled and lunged for him. My fucking mate. Don't disrespect that. Thorne yelled for everyone to get out of the bar and got out of the way himself as I knocked Sterling in the jaw. My bear had other interests, though. Out of my peripheral vision, I saw Kyle slowly strolling towards the door, not a care in the world. Even as Sterling landed a punch to my face, I spun and targeted Kyle. Thorne grabbed me before I could reach the asshole and held me back while yelling at Kyle. You want to live? I suggest you get the hell out of here. Kyle glared at me. What's your fucking problem? You boner my sister too? Sterling growled and came after Kyle too, barely held back by Hutch. Watch your fucking mouth. Presley is mine. I'd completely lost control. My voice was more bare than human at that point, and the effect seemed to scare Kyle into moving. He fled from the bar and left us growling and brawling with each other. I couldn't calm down, and I felt panic blossom in my chest. I didn't know if I'd ever find peace again. Throwing my head back, I shifted and roared at the top of my lungs. Looking around the bar, I watched Thorne approach me with his hands out. You're okay, buddy. 
You want to go splash in the creek and drink some whiskey? I growled at him and lumbered towards the door. I knew I couldn't make it through the doors as a bear, so I shifted back to human. But as my hand touched the door handle, the sweetest scent washed over me. Incoming, Thorne yelled and tossed one of the server's aprons at me. Chapter 11 Presley My anxiety was causing second thoughts to arise, but my new friends had refused to let me back out of my desire to throw caution to the wind and get a little crazy. Matt had sent me with them, letting me have the day off. I owed him big, but that wasn't anything new. I owed all of the women around me, too. They hadn't just brought me clothes and makeup that I didn't know how to use. They offered me a new life. Veronica owned a house that she didn't live in anymore now that she'd moved in with Hutch. For a while, Ophelia had stayed there, but she'd since moved in with Sterling. So Veronica offered the place to me. She practically begged, saying that she didn't like the place to sit empty. When she offered it at the same rental fee as the other house I'd been paying on, I couldn't refuse. Best of all, it came fully furnished. I'd gone from losing everything that I'd owned to blinking and having it all replaced with better things. It was like magic. I felt a little awkward taking their things, but they were pushy and insistent about me keeping the clothes and makeup. For some reason, they warmly welcomed me into their little group and made sure I was taken care of. They also teased me mercilessly about Sam, so much so that I'd cracked under their pressure and admitted everything. I told them that he'd scared me and that I'd panicked. I'd claimed Matt as my boyfriend in the heat of the moment and didn't know how to go forward. They encouraged me to call the whole thing off and go for Sam, but I couldn't express enough how much I'd been scared away from relationships by Kyle. I didn't want to say it, either, knowing that Ophelia was listening. He was still her brother. I didn't want to upset our newly formed friendship. I'd done things that day that I'd never done before. Things as simple as drinking a margarita that Georgia made for us, and swearing out loud was something worse than the word H-E double toothpick. Father would have been horrified, and I learned that I was probably okay with that. I was still scared of him, it seemed. But a day of fun with friends who weren't judging me was unbelievably freeing. They got me situated in Veronica's house and waited while I showered and got the hippie smell off of me. They then laid out clothes and made me pick ones that I liked best. I didn't know what to choose. The type of clothing that I normally would have ventured toward wasn't there. None of the women seemed to own full coverage clothing, or they'd kept those items for themselves. Instead, I was presented with an array of tight jeans and small tops that showed my bare stomach. I finally found myself a long skirt and grabbed one of the shirts and went into the bathroom to try them on. I was terrified to come out of the bathroom in the outfit I'd chosen, but once I did, their positive reactions charged me. The skirt brushed the ground as I walked, slightly too long, but it made me feel ethereal and a little like a princess. The tank top didn't meet the top of the skirt and showed my belly button. I tugged at it, and that dragged the low-cut hem too far, until I had to yank it back up. I wore my long hair down my back, waving wildly, and let them show me how to apply mascara and blush. I wasn't crazy about the feel of lip gloss, but it tasted like strawberries, and I could get used to that. When I was done, I looked in the mirror and couldn't help but smile. The woman staring back at me looked just like the woman I wanted to be on the inside. Free, a little wild, eager to wander and explore her world. Funny how a few articles of clothing and a little makeup did amazing things for my confidence. I noticed myself standing taller and holding people's gazes for longer. After a long day of hanging out at my new place, enjoying giggles and girl talk, they wanted to head to the bar and really corrupt me. Their words. I wasn't sure. The first, last, and only time I'd ever set foot in a bar, it hadn't ended well. Now they wanted us to go to the same bar here in Burden. Feeling slightly tipsy from the margarita, I was in tune with something wild in me, begging to get out. The new me wanted to test her limits. She was so far from the old me, who I'd left back in Mackin's Edge. 
I needed to get to know this new me. I was nervous, but I knew that I was ready to face whatever was waiting for me this evening. I was mature and ready to start handling my life. The other women filed into the bar and an explosion of giggles erupted. When I stepped inside and looked around to see what the laughter was all about, I got more of an eyeful than I expected. My body heated to an inferno, and a crazy feeling of instant arousal threatened to devour me whole. Standing in front of me was Sam, naked except for a too small apron tied around his waist. His facial expression morphed from surprise to ravenous. His eyes raked over my body and mine trailed over his. Without his helmet, I could see his dark hair was short-cropped and matching his stubbly beard. He had cute, boyish dimples. There was nothing boyish about his body, though. Tall, with wide, broad shoulders and a tapered waist. He was perfection. His chest was hard, and the small nipples there were slightly tanner than the rest of his golden skin. His abs looked like I could hand-wash clothes on them. Only his groin area was covered by the apron, and my eyes followed thickly muscled thighs, lightly coated in dark hair leading down to large, bare feet. Knowing that he was naked except for that square of cloth did something to me. My body ignited. I tried to remember some of the Bible verses about staying pure that Father had forced my sisters and me to chant over and over. But I couldn't think of a single one. My only thought was that obviously God had played a role in creating the man in front of me, because he was perfection. And who was I to not steal as much time as I could appreciating God's creation? My brain emptied even further when he stepped towards me, his dark blue eyes burning brightly as they continued their examination of my body. I'd just done the same to his, but having him do it to me set my skin on fire. Heat spread from my cheeks to my neck and chest. When his eyes met mine again, he licked his lips slowly and a low growl purred from his chest. I'd never heard a man other than him growl. I was quickly discovering it made me weak in the knees. I needed to move, do something, but my feet were planted firmly where I stood. I knew I was in trouble, and the new me was secretly thrilled. Sam stepped even closer, his body inches from mine but still not touching. His eyes flicked down to my mouth, and then his thumb came up and tugged my bottom lip out from between my teeth. Some wild hussy possessed me at that moment, and instead of being the old Presley, I parted my lips and gently took his thumb into my mouth. The taste of his skin exploded on my tongue, warm and sweet. Like milk chocolate I used to sneak from my mother's secret stash when no one was looking. He felt just as pleasurable, just as forbidden. There was no one around to tell me no. I stroked my tongue across his skin, only to find that every little bit of his thumb tasted just as delicious as the last. Sam growled again and caught my chin in his hand. He tipped my head up as his thumb slid from my mouth with an audible pop. His eyes bored into mine as he inched closer, his body barely brushing against mine. I felt drunk, and it had nothing to do with the mixed drink I'd had back at my new place. It was something sexual and heady that was getting to me, sucking me in and chewing me up until all that remained was a pile of boneless woman, barely able to keep her knees together. I sucked in a sharp breath and his hand claimed the skin at my side, his still damp thumb stroking close to my exposed navel. I wanted to ask what was happening, but I couldn't redirect the energy coursing through me away from my core into my brain. I was lost to whatever strange chemical magic was happening between us. I should have been afraid of the overwhelming feelings, but the newer, wilder me, the one with friends and makeup and a margarita in her, embraced it as easily as I embraced oxygen. A little voice in the back of my head told me I'd be a fool to push this away. Chapter 12 Sam I couldn't remember why I'd planned on taking it slow with Presley. Something about a boyfriend? But my bear wasn't hearing it. Seeing her had soothed him momentarily, but he was restless again. 
I couldn't smell anyone else on her, but it wasn't enough. I wanted to smell myself on her. I needed her to wear my scent. If she'd shown any sign of resistance, I would have battled myself right out the door and dealt with it. But she'd sucked my thumb into her mouth, and I knew the apron was doing nothing to hide my steel erection. She looked like a fucking goddess, with her long hair trailing down to her ass, the soft blonde waves begging for me to run my fingers through them. Her wide, sky-blue eyes were burning into me even as her hands left scorching touches as she ran them up my arms and let them rest on my chest. I couldn't hold out. I trailed my arms around her waist and caught the bottom of her ass in my hands before lifting her against my body. She locked her legs around my waist and I grunted as her skirt blocked my body from rubbing against hers. I wanted her naked. She locked her arms around my neck and lowered her mouth to my ear. Where are we going? Her soft voice had me damn near sprinting out of the bar. I looked both ways, trying to decide where to take her, but I wasn't thinking clearly. My house wasn't far, but I didn't know if I could make it that far. Especially when her hand roamed over my head, caressing my scalp. She looked down at my mouth and then fluttered her lashes at me while biting her lip. I could hear her heart pounding and her scent was rolling over me in waves, making my mouth water. Unable to resist, I lowered my mouth to hers and kissed her. Her lips were soft and plump under mine, and I knew I was hers. There was no way back now, if there ever had been a way. I tasted her lips, lightly running my tongue over them, gently exploring her. Strawberry was my reward and my bear wanted to roar. He was so happy. I pulled away and walked a few more feet before the urge was too strong. Pinning her against the side of the bar, I kissed her again. Tilting my head, I angled our mouths and gently pulled her bottom lip into my mouth, lightly biting it. Presley moaned in my arms. She stroked her tongue over my lips and pulled back. You taste like chocolate here, too. I have to get you to a bed. I pushed against the bar and ate up the ground under my feet in long, strong strides. The motion caused Presley's body to bounce against mine, and I had to stop twice more on the way to my house. Once to pin her against someone's garage, and then against a tree so I could kiss her senseless. When I finally pressed her against the door to my house, I was barely holding on to any control I'd ever pretended to have. Something about the woman in my arms called to my bear in a savage, primal way that didn't allow for questions. I reached down to grab the bottom of her skirt. Yanking it up, I skimmed my hands up her calves and thighs. Swallowing her soft moan, I caught her ass in one hand and leaned back far enough to get the skirt bunched up between us and yank the apron off. When I pressed into her again, my dick pressed against her hot, damp panties. A small gasp tore from Presley's lips and she dropped her head back to rest against the door. Sam. I rocked my hips into her while gripping her ass, pulling her harder into me. I buried my face in her neck and tasted her skin. Stars threatened to explode behind my eyes as my senses cried out in pleasure. She tasted like heaven. And sighed. I tried to grab the door handle, but a sudden cry from her soft lips stopped me. Her fingers dug into my shoulders and her thighs locked around my hips. Sam! I rocked into her faster, rubbing against her core until her mouth fell open, and she called my name louder. Her panties grew damper and my control slipped. I threw the door open and let the momentum send us tumbling onto my couch. I braced the fall with one hand on the couch and the other hand under her head. Staring down at her, I couldn't help the grin I felt shaping my mouth. She was stunning. I winked at her before moving to the floor and slipping my hands under her skirt again. Edging my fingers into the lace at her hips, I carefully and slowly pulled them down. The white lace became visible at her knees and I groaned. Fucking sexy. She watched me as I caught the band of her skirt at her waist and pulled that down too. Her lip was caught between her teeth again and I growled. 
Bearing her body to my hungry eyes, I suddenly worried about premature ejaculation. I'd never had a problem in that area, but I'd never been with Presley. She was the prettiest thing I'd ever seen. I rubbed my hands up her legs and grabbed her hips to scoot her closer to me. Her gasp caused me to search her face. I've never... My bear preened at the idea of being her first in this pleasure. I pressed a kiss to her inner thigh and held her gaze. I want to taste you. Lowering my face, I trailed kisses from her thigh to the crease between her leg and core. I grazed my lips over hers and looked up at her to find her already panting. Wanting to prolong her pleasure, but not having the patience to, I dipped my tongue into her and growls as her taste exploded on my tongue. I gripped her legs a little too tightly as I pushed farther into her and then dragged my tongue up to her clit. When I circled it with my tongue and then sucked it into my mouth, her cry was broken and ragged. I devoured her core that way, long, slow licks, and then hard suctions that made her fingers dig into my scalp. I could have spent the rest of my life there, morning, noon, and night. After another orgasm rocked her body, Presley had other ideas, though. She dragged me higher, her fingers locked into my head so tight that I had no choice but to go with her. She kissed me. Her tongue slipped into my mouth and brushed over mine. Her hands trailed down my back, palms wide open, touching as she went. I scooped her into my arms and stood up. Bed or something. My eyes caught my kitchen table, and it was close enough. I swiped my arm across it, throwing the books and junk mail that had been stacked there to the ground. I put her down at the edge of the table and grabbed the tiny tank top she was wearing. Pulling it over her head, I caught sight of her chest and swore, You're going to be the death of me. I bent over and took one of her pale pink nipples into my mouth, drawing a moan from her. She gripped her legs around my waist and dragged me closer to her. I need you. Those words were the most beautiful words I'd ever heard. I kept her face in my hands and held her lust-filled gaze as I palmed myself in the other hand and rubbed my tip up and down her wet folds. Knowing I was already too far gone to last for long, I lined her bodies up and slowly pressed forward. Chapter 13 Presley I arched my back and wrapped my arms around Sam's shoulders as he filled me. My body stretched and throbbed around him, adjusting to his girth. He didn't break eye contact as he slid slowly until he was finally pressed fully against me, his entire length inside me. Instantly, I felt a thread of attachment form between us. Staring into his deep eyes, I felt things I'd never felt for anyone else. Fear threatened to creep into my consciousness, but then Sam gyrated his hips and my brain went dumb. He slowly withdrew and then pressed into me again, setting a slow and steady rhythm that felt so much calmer than the trip from the bar. I moved my arms around his neck and pulled at his hair. Sam captured my lips in a soft kiss that stole my breath. When he leaned back and looked at me again, the strain of keeping the slow rhythm was clear on his face. I dug my fingers into his back and he slid into me faster. I moaned at the sensation and nodded. More. Sam hurried his pace and his hands clenched on my ass, dragging me closer to the edge of the table. I couldn't help the cry that left my throat when his thrust grew harder. I bit down hard on my lip and tried to keep my eyes on his. My body wound tighter and tighter, the pressure building in me until I thought I'd explode from it all. Sam growled loudly and the vibrations from his chest against mine started my undoing. The pressure snapped and white-hot pleasure shot through me, tightening my body around him until he buried his head against my neck and his thrust grew erratic. I gasped as waves of pleasure crashed over me and then fell into an even stronger orgasm when Sam sank his teeth into my neck. I drew my nails down his back as I felt him release hot, pulsing jets inside me, his teeth still firmly on my neck. 
Pleasure like I'd never known wreaked havoc on my body until I was limp in his arms. Completely spent and still pulsing around him. He let go of my neck and trailed his tongue over my skin, sending another weaker wave of pleasure through my body. I moaned and shook my head. Can't take any more. With a deep chuckle, he pulled out of me and picked my completely relaxed body up. He carried me into the kitchen and put me down on the counter while he grabbed a towel and wet it in the sink. Coming back to me, he gently cleaned between my legs while kissing me. My heart sped up, feelings rushing forward that I couldn't ignore. I felt the connection between us almost as a separate living entity. My body seemed to pull towards him as though we were magnetized. The hairs of my arms, the core of me, the very blood in my veins arched towards him when he moved away to drop the towel into the sink. Unfortunately, it didn't last. When the realization of what I'd just done had finally sunk in, I felt an icy chill run through my veins. Sam still thought I was with Matt. I had slept with Sam while pretending to be dating his cousin. Worse, he'd slept with me knowing I was dating his cousin. Despite trying to become a new woman, here I was, back to my old ways. I slipped off the counter and rushed into the living room, suddenly desperate to get clothes back on my body. Whoa, where are you going? I grabbed my tank top and wiggled my head and arms through it, the familiar shame washing over me. I couldn't find my panties, so I just grabbed my skirt and stepped into it. I... I have to go. I messed up again. Sam caught me around my waist and tugged my body into his. What are you talking about? Panic grew as my mind wrapped itself around reality. Sam slept with me thinking I was in a relationship with his cousin. He knew we couldn't be together, but he'd still taken me home with him from the bar and slept with me. Sam the man slut. He wasn't the kind of guy I could trust my heart with. Now that the deed was done, he'd be content for us to go our merry way. Maybe he was figuring that Matt wouldn't find out. I had real, live, pulsing feelings for the man, and that scared the hell out of me, because in that moment... He reminded me of Kyle. Kyle, who'd managed to break my heart without ever fully having it. I could only imagine the damage Sam could do. Matt, I have to go. I have to leave now. I pulled away from him and hurried to the door. Fuck. I'm sorry, Presley. Stay. Let's talk. I'll explain this to Matt. He'll understand. His words sent me running faster. He wanted me to stay. It was even worse than I'd feared. If he chased me, I wouldn't be able to resist falling for him for long. In fact, I didn't even know him and I was already there. It didn't make any sense. I'm sorry, I have to go. I jerked open the door and took off at a sprint towards Matt's house. Gathering my skirt in my hands, I ran as fast as I could. When I realized that Sam wasn't chasing me... My disappointment annoyed me. He let me have the space I'd insisted on, yet instead of being relieved, I felt crushed. I ran so hard that I was panting and clutching at my cramping sides by the time I got to Matt's place. His truck was in the driveway, luckily, and by the time I made it to his porch, he was coming outside, his face a mask of confusion and worry. What's wrong? What happened? He tilted his head back and inhaled slowly. Fuck. I doubled over and rested my hands on my knees, sucking in air. I messed up. Mabel ran out, her big ears flopping and threw her body against mine. I toppled backwards flat on my back. She took the chance to cover my face in her kisses. Matt whistled, more of an exclamation than a call to his dog. Sam, huh? I looked up, blocking Mabel's slobbery tongue with my hand. How did you know? He grinned. I can smell him all over you. I looked down at myself and blushed. You can? How? Let's just say there's some interesting things you're going to learn in the next little while. He grabbed my hand and pulled me up. 
Even though my cousin slept with my fake girlfriend behind my back, I'm going to do him a solid. Come on, Presley. I have some things to explain to you. Chapter 14 Sam I waited as long as I could before going to talk to Matt. I felt like a backstabbing asshole, but I'd lost control. That was the only excuse I could give him for what I had done with his girlfriend. Well, that and the fact that she was my mate. All I could do now was be honest with him and hope that he understood. Who was I kidding? Of course he wouldn't understand. I not only had sex with his girlfriend, I'd marked her. I still couldn't believe I'd lost control quite so thoroughly and completely. It was almost midnight, and while I should have waited until morning, I couldn't do it. I felt like a slimy dick nugget. But I also felt calmer and more at peace than I had since meeting Presley. She was mine. She felt what I felt, I was certain. I just had to figure out why she was running from me. Was it loyalty to Matt, or was there something more? Matt's truck wasn't in the driveway when I pulled in, but I figured that due to the late hour, he'd probably be getting home soon. Sure enough, I'd no sooner killed my engine than I heard his truck coming down the road. I got out and sat on his porch steps, getting ready for what I hoped wasn't going to be too horrible of a beating. I would let Matt hit me all he wanted. I deserved it. I should have talked to him first. He got out of his truck and came at me slowly. You've visited me a lot today. We need to talk. He nodded. Yeah, we do. I just drove Presley home to her new place. I stood up and pulled my baseball hat off. So you know. That you marked my so-called girlfriend? Yeah, I know. I stuffed the hat in my back pocket and held my arms out at my side. Go ahead. Hit me. I'm not going to fight back. I messed up. Messed up how? By marking her? My mouth snapped shut. While the timing hadn't been right, marking her had been. She was mine, and I was going to be with her. There was no stopping it. Didn't think so. Fuck. I'm sorry, Matt. I should have come and talked to you. I just... It just happened. I lost control, and it just happened. I know it's a lame excuse. But the pull of the mate bond is so fucking strong. He shook his head and grinned. Shit. As much as I would love to stretch this out longer, you look pathetic, and I feel sorry for you. You feel sorry for me. He nodded. Presley and I weren't dating, Sam. She's not my girlfriend. She's just a friend. A good friend that I care deeply about, but just a friend. What? He shrugged. It wasn't my idea, that's for sure. She just panicked when she met you. Said that the feelings were too intense for her, and she did the first thing she could think of to keep you away. I bent over and sucked in a much-needed breath of air. Holy shit, she... What? Why? Why would she do that? Come in for a drink. I have some shit to tell you that you're going to be interested in. I nodded. A drink sounds perfect. I had the next day off and woke up earlier than normal to get ready for my day. I felt like a teenage boy, showering and swiping too much gel in my hair just to have to shower it out again. I pulled on my good jeans and a t-shirt that was mostly still in one piece before heading toward the veterinary clinic. After everything I'd found out the night before about Presley and her secluded, puritanical-style upbringing, I was eager to get to my mate and see how she was handling everything. Matt had told her about us the night before. About shifters, about mates, about everything. As much as it bothered me that I hadn't been the one to talk to her, I was grateful to my cousin. She knew Matt better than she knew me. 
and as much as it pained me, she undoubtedly trusted him more. I knew that it probably made her feel better to have him do it. I still felt worlds lighter. My mate wasn't taken, only scared. I could work with scared. I could show her that I was worth trusting. Bonus that I didn't have to feel like a piece of cow dung for hurting Matt, and I didn't have to worry about going feral and killing my cousin if he touched her. I was determined. I knew it might not be easy, and I was willing to take things slowly for her. But I had wanted a mate for as long as I could remember, and I was overjoyed with the one I'd gotten. I'd always known that waiting for her would be worth it. I was right. Presley was worth fighting for. Jesus, I'd turned into a sap in a matter of days, but I wasn't ashamed. I'd watched it happen to all my buddies. It was finally my turn, and I welcomed it. It meant that Lady Luck had finally smiled on me. I parked outside the clinic, just after they opened, and walked in through the front door, eager to see Presley. Matt was at the counter. He grinned when he saw me. I knew I smelled something needy and desperate this morning. I just shrugged. Where's Presley? Out at the back of the property. She's with the shelter dogs. One of them had puppies in the night, and Presley's more worried than the mama dog is. I hesitated. She okay? He grinned even wider. Go see for yourself. I headed through through the back and caught sight of her standing beside a fence, her back to me. Her long, blonde hair was blown out to the side by the wind, revealing the mark I'd left on her. Her ass was wrapped up in a pair of denim shorts that showed off a tantalizing amount of thigh, and I could see that she was in another teeny tiny tank top. I didn't see bra straps and my dick hardened painfully, but I forced myself to ignore it. I had to go easy with her. Hi. Presley jumped and turned to face me. I watched her pale skin turn ruby red. Hi. I stood next to her and looked down at the dog in front of us. She was huge, with big brown eyes that tracked me as I moved closer to Presley. There were four little balls of fur at her belly, and she leaned down and licked one as I watched. What's her name? She looked down at the dog and then back up at me. You're, um, there? I met her eyes and nodded. Yes. She straightened her spine and tucked her hair behind her adorable, if slightly large, ears. I want to see. Matt told me that you marked me. I want to see who marked me. All of you. I raised an eyebrow and she stuttered. Not like that. I mean, I mean the bear part of you. I need to see. Matt wouldn't show me, and I'm having a very hard time wrapping my mind around all this. I frowned. Are you going to freak out? She shook her head. Nope. Those days are behind me. I smiled and tossed a thankful glance at the sky over my head. My mate was amazing, and I was already deeply smitten. Okay. Not here, though. I don't want to scare the dogs. Can you take off for an hour? She shook her head. I'm watching the puppies. I need to make sure they're okay. That's fine. We can do it later. I'll stay and help with the puppies. We've got the day off, so I was hoping we could spend some time together. She pursed her lips and turned to me with her hands on her hips. Shouldn't I be angry with you? You marked me without my permission. That's a big deal, right? You're supposed to ask my permission. Now you're here and you're making me feel all these... things. It's annoying. I crossed my arms over my chest and frowned. Annoying? The frown on her own face cracked and she turned away. But not before I saw the corners of her mouth lift into a smile. It shouldn't be annoying. That's all I'm saying. Chapter 15. Presley. 
The world outside Mackin's Edge was crazy. Crazier than it had ever been growing up in the secluded flock of followers. That was really saying something. Matt had told me everything there was to know and more about shifters, mates, and bears. Matt was a bear shifter. Sam was a bear shifter. Ophelia was a bear shifter. And Kyle wasn't, which was even more confusing. But I had bigger things to worry about. Sterling and the rest of Sam's friends were bear shifters, too. The whole town was full of bear people. They literally turned into bears and ran around as another species. They turned into bears. As much as I'd wanted to run far away screaming when Matt had started telling me about it, I couldn't. I'd been frozen motionless in my seat, listening intently to every word like the robots in Father's flock listened to his venomous sermons. It crossed my mind that maybe I'd left one cult only to meet up with another. I knew Matt, though. He wasn't crazy. He wasn't a member of any cult. He was a closeted gay man who had the biggest heart of anyone I knew, and who'd taken me under his wing when my own family didn't want me anymore. And I knew Ophelia. She was the woman who forgave me when I didn't deserve to be forgiven and gave me her very own clothing when I had none. The people he was talking about weren't loony, self-righteous bigots. They were friends. And Sam. Sam was the man that had turned me head over heels. I wanted to see this phenomenon for myself, but I was nervous, too. Matt had made it clear that they would still be friendly when they shifted. But I was worried. I was also worried about mates. He'd explained it as I was meant for Sam and Sam was meant for me. Apparently that was why the reaction was as instantaneous and as intense as it was. It wouldn't go away and there was no getting it to fade, especially since Sam had marked me. We were basically married in shifter culture, apparently. I was essentially married to the man whom Matt had referred to as a manslot. What was I supposed to do with that? I hadn't had to wait long to find out because he'd arrived at the veterinary clinic first thing that morning. He looked deliciously good in jeans and a t-shirt that had a hole in the chest, just big enough that I could see the side of his nipple through it. My desire for him was still there. Stronger, it seemed, now that it was infused with the memories of having amazing sex the day before. Maybe now that I knew how amazing the sex was, I'd turned into a little bit of an animal myself. I resisted the urge to reach out and run a finger and touch that little patch of skin that was showing, somehow, and focused on Star and her puppies. Her name is Star. The puppies are Stella, Stoney, Stuart, and Stag. Sam looked over at me with his raised eyebrows, and a smile revealed his killer dimples. You named them like that? I felt my cheeks heat and nodded. I like when things sound similar. He nodded as if it made complete sense. Want to show me around? I'm thinking about getting a dog. I went over to talk to Matt last night and ended up with Mabel cuddled next to me, her head in my lap for hours. It was nice. I didn't have to try very hard to picture myself curled next to him with my head in his lap. I tried to focus on the puppies in front of me instead. Sam being a bear didn't change things. I didn't think, anyway. Star needs a home. She shouldn't have to raise her babies here. He looked over at me and just stared. You want me to take Star, Stella, Stony, Stuart, and Stag? All of them? I looked away from his intense stare and gripped the fence in front of me. My body wouldn't stop reacting to him, and it was driving me insane. She needs a home. They all do. He edged closer. I'm a firefighter, Presley. They would be alone a lot. Unless, of course, someone was there to look after them for me while I was on long shifts. I snapped my head around to him. Are you asking me to come by your house? Yep. 
to check on the puppies. His mouth left it on one side, a dimple appearing again. Or me. I grabbed his hand and pulled him away from the fence. I want you to show me right now. I needed to know if it was true. I needed to know if what Matt told me was for real. If it was, then the part about Sam and I actually being mates was true too, and that changed things. My hand tingled where it was clasped in his. And I looked up at him to find him staring at our entwined hands with an odd expression. What? He looked at me and blinked a few times. You feel that? I bit my lip and nodded. He shook his head and grinned, giving a boyish charm to his handsome face. I've waited a long time to feel something like that. My heart did a little shimmy, but I put a stop to it. I didn't even know if what I'd been told was real yet. I had to be sure. Come on, can't you show me around here? Sam looked around at the property and shook his head. Too open. And not everyone in town knows about us. I'll take you somewhere more secluded to show you if that's okay. Secluded sounded good. I shook my head at myself. I was reacting to Sam in ways that had never been okay in Mackin's Edge. My naughty streak had grown, it seemed, and I couldn't help but want to roll around in it. I was supposed to be living and learning. I couldn't do that unless I let go of the teachings that had been ingrained in me since the day I was born. Sure. Secluded. A plan started to form in my mind. A plan that the old Presley would never have concocted. Sam walked faster, pulling me after him to find Matt. I'm trying my hardest to keep this PG-13, Presley, so I'm going to need you to stop looking at me like that. I blushed. Like what? He tossed a look back at me. Like you're thinking about really dirty things. A giggle escaped from the evil side of me and I clamped a hand over my mouth, mumbling through an apology. I took over the leave and dragged him into Matt's office. Matt was seated at his desk, a smirk on his face at the sight of us holding hands. Well, this is cute. I made a face at him. Is it okay if I run out for a little bit? I'm making Sam show me the... thing. Matt barked a short laugh. You've changed, Presley. And to think you used to be such a good girl. Odd that his words had mirrored my thoughts. Not that thing, perv. He motioned me out of the office. Go on. I've got the office for an hour or so. I need you back before 11, though. We're taking a trip out to Old Man Swinton's farm to check on a colt and his mama. I'll be back before then. Sam cleared his throat and rested his hand on my back. She'll be back before eleven. I started to protest and then decided against it. If all checked out, I had a plan to carry out. Chapter 16 Sam I drove Presley out to a stretch of forest that I knew would be empty and hurried around the truck to help her out. With my hands around her waist, I put her down right in front of me and smiled down at her. You're sure you're ready for this? She nodded. I have to see it to believe it. I took her hand, warming at the sensation that buzzed from the contact, and pulled her after me into the trees. Finding a clearing, I let her go and stepped a few feet in front of her. I reached over my head and grabbed my shirt, pulling it off. What are you doing? Her voice sounded huskier. I have to strip down first. I don't want to shred these clothes. This is the best outfit I own. She surprised me with a grin. There's a hole in the shirt. I could see your nipple. My dick hardened at the word nipple like I was 14. I was surprised I didn't start giggling. Well, I don't want it to get worse. She found a log to sit on and watched me with the focus of a surgeon. I kicked out of my boots and then dragged my pants and briefs down in one go. I tossed them all over a branch and stood there naked. Are you sure you're ready? She was staring at my dick with wide eyes. You're... 
I looked down and then back at her. Hard? Yeah. Being around you does that to me. She met my eyes and I got the scent of her arousal. Do it. I said a quick prayer that she wouldn't suddenly freak out and run, then shifted. Immediately, I got down on my belly, trying to appear smaller to her. I knew I was probably scary. Much to my surprise, though, instead of being afraid, she slid off her log and gasped, It's true. I chuffed at her and made a show of rolling onto my back. Presley giggled and moved closer. Can I touch you? I rolled over and nudged my head into her outstretched palm. My bear had died and gone to heaven. His mate was stroking his fur, scratching behind his ears, and even rubbing her face against his. You're so soft and beautiful. I can't believe it. Sam, this is amazing. She looked into my eyes and pressed a kiss to the top of my nose. Can you hear me? I nodded and waited for what my surprising little mate was going to say. It's easier to say what I have to say to you now that you're a bear. I'm embarrassed to say it, but I need something from you. I waited. She giggled. I guess you're not going to respond, huh? I need help. I want to live. Maybe we can talk about the details later, but if we're mates, that means you're supposed to be stuck with me, right? Maybe we can spend some of our time trying stuff? I want you to show me things, Sam. I was purring like a kitten as she whispered to me while stroking my fur. I didn't know what she fully meant, but I was willing to explore with her. I would do anything for her. I know it sounds crazy, but I want to be wild. I've never lived in the outside world before, but I want to live freely. I want to learn to be a modern woman, as crazy as that sounds. I think I'll probably need to take some things slowly, though. She laughed. Some things. Others I think we'll keep at the same pace. I'd taken all that I could take. I shifted back and tugged her into my arms as she gasped. You're killing me. Her eyes were wide and her lips were parted as she stared up at me. That's cheating. Go back to the bear. He's easier to talk to. I dipped my head and caught her mouth in a searing kiss. I felt it down to my toes and then back up. Holding her face in my hands, I tilted up and deepened the kiss. Presley moaned and her small hands dropped to my sides, the blunt edges of her fingertips biting into my skin. Her chest rubbed against mine with each labored breath as she pulled back slightly. This is crazy. You turn into a bear. I nodded. Yeah, I do. You seem to be handling it pretty well. She looked thoughtful. I'm just trying to wrap my brain around it all. I heard plenty of crazy things in Macken's Edge, but this takes the cake. I sense a hesitation. But... I'm nervous. Why? I would never hurt you. It's not the bear hurting me that I'm worried about. It's the man. I swore off men. After everything that happened, I'm not ready to rush into anything. I had to get my dick put away if I was going to be able to have a serious conversation. I grabbed my pants and pulled them on quickly. We have forever. I won't rush you if you need me to go slow. You slept with me when you thought I was with Matt. Would you have been okay with me being that kind of person? I frowned. You're my mate, Presley. Nothing else matters. I felt horrible about what I had done to Matt and went straight to his house to apologize, but it still wouldn't have mattered. As a shifter, he would have understood. He would have had to. There's something in us burning for the other. I know you feel it. You can't walk away from that. You can't ignore it. I didn't think twice about you sleeping with me when I thought you were with Matt because I was right there with you. I knew it was inevitable. My bear, he craves you. I crave you. She bit her lip and her eyes roamed down to my chest. Forever? 
I caught her lip with my thumb and tugged it out from between her teeth. We'll go slow. Whatever you need. We can get to know each other and go from there. Sure, it's backwards, but it's fine. We can put a hold on the sex for a little while, until you're really ready. Fuck, what was I saying? I didn't want to put a hold on it. I was still hard as a rock and could barely see straight with the need for her pulsing through me. Okay. I forced a smile and grabbed my shirt. I needed as many layers between us as possible. I'll get you back to the clinic and hang out there with you for a little while, until you have to go out to the farm with Matt. Maybe we can have dinner tonight. She nodded and nodded her fingers together as we walked back to the truck. Her face was decidedly disappointed, but I couldn't understand why. I thought I'd said the right thing. My little mate was unsettled about something, but I was lost. I kept quiet, deciding to wait for her to tell me in her own time. Chapter 17 Presley I must have fallen and bumped my head on the way into the forest, because every conviction I'd had about taking things slow and easy had flown out of the window when I saw Sam as a huge grizzly bear. It was real. We were mates, and he was using words like forever. There, wrapped up in a pretty package of hard abs and sexy dimples, was the gift I'd been missing. The man walking to his truck in front of me was what I wanted, and needed. He was what I desired when I was alone in my bed at night, and my thoughts drifted back to Kyle. It was never Kyle I had longed for, I knew that. I'd longed for the things that I'd always hoped would come with Kyle being loved and cared about. Kyle had been crap at it, but I knew in my gut that Sam wouldn't be. What was I doing? I didn't want to take it slow. My entire speech with his bear had been an embarrassing request for him to explore with me, sexually. I thought he got it, but then he put his pants on. I wasn't being clear, evidently. I had been embarrassed by what I'd been trying to say to him still under the cloak of father's shaming. Suddenly, I wanted the cloak off of me. I want to have sex with you. Sam stumbled and then turned to face me. What? That's what I meant. That's what I'd been trying to tell your bear. You. I don't want to wait. I want to have sex. Wild sex. I want to learn things with you. Things I've never done before. I need help learning things, though. Other things, too. Simple things like skinny dipping and painting and hiking. I don't know. Fun things. I've lived in a backward hole for my entire life and I'm out now. I want to live. I sucked in a breath. I want to be with you and I want to have experimental sex. He just stared at me open-mouthed. My face flamed and I tossed up my hands. Never mind, just forget it. Sam caught my arm when I tried to walk by him and pushed me against the side of his truck, immediately holding me there with his body pushed against mine. There's nothing I want more than to fuck you senseless, Presley. I just need to be sure you're sure. I don't want to push you. Frustrated, I reached between us and yanked my shirt over my head. I've never been more sure of anything in my entire life. Do I have to beg? He grabbed my sides and lifted me onto the hood, dragging my shorts down and nearly dragging me with them. Nope. No begging. Not today. We can try that another day, though. The promise of another day and something dirty made me moan, and I covered my mouth with my hand when I realized how loud it had been. Sam paused with his hands on the sides of my panties and tugged them halfway down my thighs. No covering that. That can be the first part of us exploring. Be as loud as you want to be, baby. I glanced around. We're out in the open, Sam. He finished pulling my panties off and slipped them into his pocket. One of the benefits of being a shifter is that I can hear if anyone's coming. Right now, there's no one for miles. We're safe. Be loud, yell, scream, moan. Let me hear how good I make you feel. 
Sam lowered his mouth between my legs, and I let him hear how amazing he felt. The first exploration was eye-opening. Take your clothes off. Sam grinned wickedly at me and pulled his own shirt over his head. Now. I looked around and shook my head. No way, Sam, this is crazy. He stopped with his hands on his belt buckle and stared at me. I'm just going to remind you that a few hours ago you were spread eagle on my truck naked as the day you were born. This isn't different, and it's on your bucket list. My cheeks were bright red. We were in the woods that surrounded the town, alarmingly close to the bar, as well as all the houses that surrounded the center of town. There are people close by. He moved nearer to me, his eyes darker than the night sky, and grabbed my hips. Pulling me into his body, he leaned down and brushed his mouth over my ear. When he spoke, his voice was dark and gruff. Get naked, baby. I won't let anyone see you. Lord have mercy. My heart pounded in my chest, but there was a more demanding pounding south of my belly that called louder. Sam was exploring with me, letting me experience something wild. I did want it. I had to let myself go. Shedding my clothes from my trembling body, I stood in front of the creek with Sam watching me. He was naked and his body was responding to me in a big way. And now? His smile was that of a predator and it turned my blood to lava. Now we swim. That's the point of skinny dipping, right? It wasn't exactly what I wished the point of skinny dipping to be. I wanted to touch Sam again. I couldn't get enough of his body. I couldn't get enough of him. Sure. He walked into the water up to his waist and looked back at me. Come on in. I stepped in and gasped. It's freezing, Sam. He nodded. Yep. I shook my head. Too cold. He moved towards me. Don't make me come get you. You wouldn't. Before I even had the chance to really run, he had his arms wrapped around my waist and was dragging me into the water. He dunked both of us and came up laughing when I tried to climb his body to get out of the water. You're a mean bear. He showed me his teeth and then playfully bit my shoulder. That's me, a big, bad bear. And you're my Rapunzel. We're mixing up fairy tales. I wrapped my arms and legs around his body and shivered from the cold water. What do you know about fairy tales? He wrapped an arm around my back and kept my face with his free hand. They never had enough sex. Giggling, I laced my fingers behind his neck. That's because fairy tales are meant for children. Sam kissed me, easing his tongue into my mouth to taste me while his hand tangled in my hair and pulled. He tasted like the chocolate cake we'd shared after dinner. I moaned into the kiss and pouted when he pulled away. I was opening my mouth to complain when I heard it. People were walking through the woods, laughing and talking. My eyes went wide and I dug my fingers into Sam's shoulders. We're going to get caught. He shook his head. Not shifters. They won't smell us if we're quiet. They won't hear us either. I bit my lip. This is a bad idea. Sam dipped his head and flicked his tongue over the mark on my neck. No, it's a good idea. And it's going to get better. Make sure you stay quiet this time, Presley. I gasped as he suddenly filled me. My core squeezed tight around him and my body was instantly already too close to a blissful orgasm. He gripped my butt in his hands and settled us lower into the water. Using his hands, he forced my body up and down his length. With his mouth next to my ear, his roughened voice barely audible. There are people walking by right now, and all they'd have to do to see us is turn and look in this direction, and maybe take a few steps closer. The idea should have sent me running from the creek in the opposite direction. But it didn't. Instead, my body clenched tighter around him, and I held on to him, wondering if I'd lost all sense of sanity. Chapter 18 Sam We both climaxed quickly that night in the creek and snuck back into our clothes as quietly as we could before running through the woods. 
back to Presley's house, giggling like high schoolers. We fell through our front door, already halfway to making love again. That time it lasted longer and carried us both into a deep sleep. I woke up before Presley, but stayed in bed, watching her sleep. Her hair had dried it to a wild array of twists and curls, stretching all around her pillows and then down the bed. I got the silky strands in my fingers and smiled. She was stunningly beautiful and sweet, caring and funny. She was braver than she gave herself credit for, too. I didn't know all the details of her past, but I was going to find out. My mate was a wildcat, hiding under a thin layer of fear and repression. I would take her any way she was, but I was excited to watch her as she battled and conquered her fear. She had nothing to be afraid of. I would always be here to look after her, no matter what. Presley stirred and stretched. Her eyes opened slowly, and she blushed when she saw me. She immediately caught her lip between her teeth and dragged the sheet up to her chin. I sat up against the headboard and pulled her into my lap, ignoring her shy act. What's on your mind this morning, Presley? She finally met my eyes, and the blush traveled down to her chest, which caught my attention and held it. Her body was beautiful, and I was helpless, a slave to it. He got a little crazy last night. I grinned and turned her until she was drowdling me. She had to face me that way. We did, and you liked it. Are you having regrets? She nodded and then shook her head. But I should be. We practically had sex in front of those people. I shrugged. I never would have let them actually see you. I'm not one for sharing what's mine. And you, Rapunzel, are mine. Her breath quickened. This feels... Why does it feel like I've woken up just like this every morning for my whole life? Because we're made for each other. This is how it's supposed to be. She reached up and started gathering her hair, twisting it around and around until it was a knot at the top of her head. I never expected anything like this. I was mesmerized watching her hands work her hair around and then in awe when it just stayed on top of her head without any kind of contraption to hold it in place. I stared at it, waiting for it to fall over. When it stayed, I couldn't help kissing her hard and longed to see if it would survive a kiss. It did. You're amazing. I gently touched her hair and then trailed my fingertip down the side of her face and over her lips. I was already crazy about her. I'm lucky to have you, and I'll do everything I can to make sure that I'm good enough for you. Good enough? Tears filled her eyes and she rested her head on my shoulder. No one has ever been this good to me. I kissed her. They were all fools. Now come on, I've got plans for today. She frowned. You do? With you. Her smile came back and her eyes sparkled. What are we doing? Crossing more things off your bucket list. I eased us off the bed and put her down in front of me. Get dressed. Wear something you can get dirty in. Chapter 19 Presley Just one week, and I already knew I was in deeper than I'd ever been before. I was head over heels for Sam. Deeper, even. He was the man I'd been waiting for my entire life, but hadn't known to dream up. I didn't know a man so perfect for me could exist. It was corny and dreamy and everything I'd ever prayed for. It was also edgy and steamy and everything I'd been warned against. Sex with Sam was never boring or just so-so. It was hot and wild every time. Each time felt hotter and better than the last. I felt like I'd died and gone to heaven. I still felt anxious at times. It was scary to care about someone so suddenly and so much. My feelings for Sam were like a locomotive, though. There was no stopping them. 
especially not with something as weak as willpower. Not my willpower. Not when it came to the man. The bear. Somewhere between painting each other's bodies and going to Dallas for a rock concert, I decided to throw caution to the wind. I was letting go, being free and wild. I hadn't mastered carefree yet, but I was getting there. Sam had a list in his head of things that were supposedly on my bucket list. Or it should be on my bucket list. And he was working us through them. I didn't have the heart to tell him that the only real things on my bucket list were to learn to be a proper adult and to let go of the lingering hold the teachings of father and growing up in the flock had on me. Anyway, I liked doing the things on his list. They were exciting and fun, and they always ended or started in some insane sex thing. We'd done things that I'd never imagined. Things that made me blush to think about. Things that weren't the least bit ladylike. I loved them. I was pretty sure I loved Sam. Why, Kyle? Sam's voice drew me from my thoughts and back to him. I looked up at him from where I was resting across his chest and smiled. He was beautiful to look at. What? I asked why Kyle. What made him so special to you? There was a trace of annoyance in his voice that I'd come to understand was jealousy. He had the same tone whenever we were around Sterling, which wasn't often. I hadn't thought about Kyle. My mind was full of Sam and happy things. He was the only outsider who came to Mac and Zedge, I guess. I saw him as different, dangerous, and he was compared to the boys I grew up around. I'd only been out of Mac and Zedge a few times and never without a strict chaperone, before he started asking me out on the sly. I see now that it wasn't actually Kyle I was attracted to. He stroked his hand over my hair. Do you miss Mac and Zedge? I sighed. I miss my sisters. I don't miss anything else. How could I? My whole day consisted of waking up, doing whatever father ordered, going to church where I listened to father some more, praying, then going to bed. Next day, get up, do it again. And if I ever strayed from anything father taught, I got a swift crack across the face. He rules everything there. He's mean and judgmental, and I really don't miss him. Sam growled. Say the word and I'll take care of him. I rolled onto my stomach and walked my fingers up his chest. I like when you're the big bad bear. You don't have to be about this, though. It's over. I'm not there anymore. He can't boss me around. I wish my sisters would leave Mac and Zedge, but they're stuck. Brainwashed. They won't even write me back. We could just go visit them. There's nothing stopping you. I sat up and shook my head. There's a whole world stopping me. If they want to talk to me, they'll write me back. I'm not going to start anything. The only way my father will have me back is if I'm crawling back on my hands and knees begging. And then I'll have to do penance for the rest of my days. I don't plan on any of that happening anytime soon. Anytime ever. You have a home with me now. I grinned. Say it again. He grabbed me and pulled me on top of him. You have a home with me now. And you'd better get used to it. Chapter 20 Presley Sitting at the bar with Ophelia, Georgia, Veronica, and Allie felt strange. A part of me felt like getting up and getting out of there. I couldn't figure it out at first, not until Allie noticed and shook her head. It's Sam. Well, it's not having Sam nearby. After you find your mate and get together, especially for the first couple of weeks, any time spent apart is weird. It's slightly painful and very unnerving. We all went through it. Even Georgia, though she'll deny it. Ophelia sighed. Are we implying that I'm not still going through it? Because I am. Veronica nodded. Me too. 
not so much uncomfortable, but like one of my limbs isn't functioning properly or something. I frowned and ran my finger over the sweating glass of alcohol in front of me. It just all happened so quickly. They responded with nods of agreement. Allie scowled like she was remembering something unpleasant. Too fast. I remember my head spinning, if I'm not mistaken. Thorne was awful. He didn't want to mate. He ran and hid from me. Hutch was even worse, chimed in Veronica. You don't seem to be getting much resistance from Sam. I was getting zero resistance from Sam. It was almost too easy. He was perfect, and that scared the hell out of me. He's too good to be true. Ophelia made a cute face and noise at me. No, I mean he's too good to be true. There must be something there that's wrong. He's too good. He cares about me. He's open with how he's feeling. He does things in bed that I can't even pretend to complain about. He's everything I always said I wanted, and I do. I do want it. It's just... It just doesn't make sense that it exists. Everything I'm describing is amazing, but it doesn't exist in one man. I'm waiting on the other shoe to drop, and I hate it. I haven't had good experiences with the men in my life. There has to be a problem. Ophelia winced and shook her head. My brother did a number on you, huh? I grabbed her hand and held it. Father outshines your brother any day of the week. Kyle gave me some wounds, but I'm always holding my breath waiting for Sam to be like father, not Kyle. Georgia tossed back her drink and glared at the empty glass. I know all about daddy issues. Your daddy dearest might take the cake, though. Mine was nothing more than a checking account at the end of the day, but he never laid a hand on me. I think you need to clear the air between the two of you. At least say your piece. Gain some closure. We need to go pay a visit to your dad. Alarm surged through me. That's a horrible idea. That's the worst idea I've ever heard. That's the Olympic gold medal of bad ideas. Georgia was undeterred. She shook her head so hard that her ponytail slapped the side of her head. No, you need to confront him and handle your issues, Presley. Now, while he's still alive. He's keeping your relationship with Sam from progressing. Sam is a good guy and you're terrified of him. That doesn't make sense. I'm not terrified of Sam. You're terrified of him. I've seen the way you look at him. There's a whole lot of lust, sure. But there's also this side glance you give him. You watch him for signs that he's going to suddenly snap. I opened my mouth to argue. But they all gave me looks that said they agreed with Georgia. I didn't think I watched Sam for that reason. I was wary, of course, but I didn't think it was to the point of it being an issue in our relationship. And if that isn't proof enough, you were just telling us that the fact that Sam isn't full of flaws is a problem. I frowned. Those weren't my exact words, Georgia. Same difference. He's your mate. He's supposed to be perfect for you. You've got to let go of all the religious mumbo-jumbo that's been pounded into your head and give in to the mate bonding process. And I think that facing your dad will help you move on. Allie shook her head. Maybe this isn't the best idea. If she's not ready, she's not ready. There's nothing good that can come from pushing her too far too fast, Georgia. Ophelia shrugged. On the other hand, even a good guy can only be patient for so long. I nearly pushed Sterling away. It hasn't been that long. I slumped in my chair and then sat back up when Veronica nodded to my chest that was precariously close to tumbling from its low-cut confinement. This is too much. I just want to talk about something else for a while. They accepted my avoidance immediately and started talking about the new family they'd seen in town. Veronica thought the wife was a prime candidate for her erotic book club. She thought I was, too, but I was having enough eroticism without a book or a club. I couldn't help thinking about Sam and the way they said I'd been acting with him. I was lost to the man. But I had been waiting for something bad to happen. I couldn't help it. I didn't completely trust him, even though he'd done nothing to deserve my mistrust. 
I was taking out my issues on him, and it scared me to think of him getting tired of it and moving on. I'd heard him whispering to me when he thought I was sleeping. He made promises that sent my heart racing. Promises about staying with me forever. Loving me forever. I wanted to believe that he wouldn't ever break those promises. But what if there was a limit to what he was willing to take from me? I knew that if things went sour with him, I'd be ruined. None of the things I'd learned about living independently would save me from the devastation that losing him would cause. Matt wouldn't be able to help me. The woman around me wouldn't be able to help. If Georgia was right, facing Dad to save what I had with Sam was worth it. I stood up suddenly and nodded to myself. I'll do it. I'm going to Mackin's Edge. They cheered for me and stood up, too. I raised an eyebrow. You're all going to come along? Allie laughed. All for one and one for all. Just consider us your backup musketeers. Ophelia nodded. And we can swing by Kyle's, too, if you need to yell at him. I thought about it. It may not be a horrible idea. Veronica clapped her hands. And Mr. McRaney hasn't returned the library book he borrowed two months ago. If you need somebody else to yell at, I mean. I shrugged. Why not? Georgia wiggled around in her spot. Wyatt's been leaving the toilet seat up, even though I keep telling him that it's dangerous to my well-being. I fell into the bowl last week. The dumb bear just laughed. Allie grinned. Thorne always puts the toilet seat down for me. I'm pretty sure Hutch pees outside. Isn't that weird? There's a toilet ten feet away, but he'll walk outside. I'm dating a wild animal. Sterling had a collection of panties. He said he'd forgotten about them in the back of his closet, and that's why he hadn't gotten rid of them. Ophelia quickly jerked her head around to me. Not yours. They were from when he was younger. My face burned and I cleared my throat. Maybe we should just go? It was quiet for a second, and then we all laughed together. We were crazy, but sane enough to realize just how crazy. So? I looked to each of them. We're going to Mackin's Edge. They each smiled at me and nodded. Georgia stepped forward and put her hand on my shoulder. We've got you back. We'll even carry you home later, after we come back here and get hammered. Sounded pretty good to me. Chapter 21 Sam You're sure this is what you want to do? I shot Hutch a dirty look. Mate hey, Presley, what kind of a question is that? He laughed and hit me in the arm. I mean the land, dumbass. I know Presley's your mate. It is slightly worrying that's where your mind went when we've been talking about you buying this property. What's going on? I looked around at the large clearing and at the forest surrounding it. It would be perfect for our home. It was only a few minutes outside of town, but it'd be private enough for all the things I had in mind for Presley. Shit, I don't know. Wyatt walked up and lifted an eyebrow at me. What don't you know? Presley is holding back. I think she's scared. I'm not sure she'll appreciate such a huge gesture so soon. Hutch nodded and kicked at the grass beneath our feet. With the shit I've heard about Mac and Zedge, can you blame her? And the shit with Kyle, she's got a reason to be fearful. But I'm her mate. And she's human. She doesn't get it yet, brother. She'll get there. Sterling pulled his hat off and spun it around on his hand. I'm sure she's just a little shell-shocked. It doesn't mean anything, though. I've seen the way she looks at you. She's in love with you, man. I growled instinctively and then cut myself short. Sorry. He grinned at me and shrugged. I get it. I think you're worrying for nothing. Just keep showing her that you're the real deal. It's only been a couple of weeks. A couple of amazing weeks. I had to get her comfortable with me because my bear was restless about the way she looked at us every so often. Her hesitation. He wanted her. All of her. I did too. 
I just have to work harder to show her that I was completely all in for her. The land could do that, or it could backfire. Our land. I planned to put her name on it when I closed the deal, and then I'd let her sit down with the planners and pick out whatever kind of house she wanted. I had a nest egg I'd been saving for a house, and I was more than willing to blow through it, and more to show her what forever meant to me. Enough of this shit. Let's get back to the bar and celebrate the land with a couple of bottles of whiskey. The women should be there. If we're lucky, they'll dance on the tables tonight. Thorn grinned and rubbed his hands together. Allie on a table in a skirt. Jesus, how did we get so lucky? I thought of seeing the still mostly shy Presley at the cave, dancing on a table, and had to adjust myself in my jeans. She'd loosened up a lot, and I was excited to see her come out of her shell even more. She was a beautiful thing when she let go. Or when she didn't. Either way, she took my breath away. We piled into my truck and headed back to the bar. I was anxious. There was a nagging feeling at the back of my mind that something wasn't right, and I wanted to put my fears to rest. I knew seeing her would make it disappear, so I sped the whole way back. Someone's excited about the idea of seeing his woman. I scowled at Wyatt and parked. I haven't forgotten that I owe you an ass-whooping. You and your band of merry wilderness freaks nearly burned an entire mountain down. He scowled back at me. Don't remind me. Seriously, don't. That was the worst week of my life. Dramatic much? Sterling grunted when Wyatt elbowed him in the stomach. Not cool. I hurried inside the bar and looked around. There was no sign of her mates. That anxious noodling grew. But the rest of the guys seemed fine. Thorne grunted. I guess they went on their own adventure. Allie never tells me where they're going. They'll be back, though. I'd told Presley earlier that I had to run into work for a couple of hours, and we'd agreed to meet at the bar, so I knew she'd be back. I didn't like lying to her, but it was a setup for my surprise. The land was perfect, and hopefully it wouldn't take long to get it purchased and a house started on it. I was impatient. I wanted to wake up every morning with my woman by my side, knowing that that's where she was going to be for the rest of my life. I sat at my normal table with the guys and thanked the waitress after she dropped off a bottle of whiskey and shot glasses for us. Throwing a shot back, I whistled. She'd brought over the good whiskey. Well, it's a special occasion, Thorn. He grinned. Call me sentimental, but all five of us are now mated. We finally grew up. Wyatt snorted. I'd hardly say any of us grew up. Sterling scoffed. I grew up. Just so we're clear, I grew up. You grew up about as much as a spoiled toddler grows into an obnoxious kindergartner. Hutt shook his head and laughed. If anyone grew up, it was me. I raised my eyebrows. None of you grew up. Listen to you arguing like a bunch of old ladies. Sterling rolled his eyes. How can we be old ladies if we didn't grow up? You made my point. Thank you. I grew up. Thorn refilled our glasses. You're all dumb fucks. And you're not? He glared at Wyatt before taking a shot. You almost burned down an entire mountain. You're getting bears drunk on top shelf whiskey. Who's the real dumb fuck here? We're not paying for this. Sterling laughed. I saw you drive into a wall last week because you were watching a butterfly. You caused a thousand dollars worth of damage to the car, idiot. I wasn't watching a butterfly, you asshole. I thought a bee was attacking me. That's not what you said. You said there was a butterfly in the car with you. Hutch, I may be your younger brother, but I can still kick your ass. I'd like to see you try, butterfly boy. I leaned back in my chair and watched them fight, content to stay out of it for the time being. My bear was distracted, worried about Presley. She needed a cell phone so I could get in touch with her when she went missing. It didn't make any sense how worried I felt, but something felt off. Annoyed at myself, I threw back shot after shot in an attempt to relax. Presley was gaining her independence from her father and her freaky flock of Bible thumpers and Mackin's Edge. She could do whatever she needed and wanted. 
I wasn't about to stifle her sense of freedom. I just had to deal with it. I held that conviction for about a half an hour. Did anyone text their mate to see where they are, goddammit? Thorne laughed at me. So lovesick. Allie texted me. They're on their way back. She didn't say what they were on their way back from, but I get the feeling it didn't go well. I frowned. I don't like hearing that. Ophelia just texted me. Apparently they went to Macken's Edge. My bear rose to the surface faster than I could control it. I was sprouting fur before I managed to stop it. Standing, I shook my head. She should have taken me. If anyone hurt her, I'll kill him with my bare hands. Thorne slid another bottle of whiskey towards me. They would have called us if anyone was hurt or in trouble. I couldn't just sit around waiting. Shaking my head, I strode away from the table. I was going to find my mate. My bear wouldn't calm until I did. Chapter 22 Presley As a devoted upholder of thy holy writ, Lord, thy judgment sent forth through I, your humble servant on earth, shall be carried out without question. Thy faithful flock shall bear witness that this apostate who stands before us, evil sinner born from my very own seed, has fallen prey to the corruption and idolatry of the outsiders, those with wicked intent, the filthy whores of Satan. Father stood at the top of the porch stairs waving his arms, his voice booming and quivering with trumped-up emotion as though he were preaching from his pulpit on Sunday morning. This is the way things had gone since we'd arrived in Mackin's Edge, not more than twenty minutes prior. I had tried to explain calmly and rationally that I needed to find my own way in the world, but, of course, my words fell on deaf ears. Father continued his impromptu sermon of insult and degradation, until I couldn't stand it any more. Stop. Please, Father, just stop. I cried out. Although I expected him to lash out physically. The strength behind his hand as he struck me made me reel, and I momentarily saw stars. I heard growling behind me. What had I been thinking, coming here? There was no use. My sisters stood watching on the porch, arms crossed over their chests. I knew what was going through their minds. I was a heathen, an apostate the one who had turned her back on all that was righteous and pure and embraced the evil darkness. They no longer felt I had any hope of redemption. I couldn't blame them, I supposed. They had been programmed the same way I had. Only for some reason, my programming hadn't stuck. My eyes filled with tears of frustrated humiliation. But before I would let them spill, before I would give any of them any more satisfaction, I turned and fled, stumbling blindly back to George's car. Okay, so that could have gone better. Georgia finally broke the heavy silence from the driver's seat. Much better. I released a bitter laugh. This was the stupidest idea. Allie turned from the front seat and held my hand. We're sorry, Presley. We wouldn't have pushed you into it if we had known it was going to be like that. I should have known better. I should have stopped it. I'm a fool for thinking any interaction with that man could end well for me. Ophelia sat next to me, patting a napkin against my split lip and growled. You should have let me at least maim him. It would have been so satisfying. Bloodthirst had never been a sin I had been tempted by. But tonight... A part of me had almost wanted Ophelia to shift and tear into father. I bit my lip and gasped as my teeth caught the split on my lower lip. I feel like screaming every curse word I know. I knew about four or five now. Georgia looked at me through the rearview mirror and nodded. Do it. You're not stuck in that god-awful place anymore. You can swear as loud as you want. The rest of us do it daily and our immortal souls are just fine and dandy. Not that Daddy Darius would agree. I can't. I rested my head in my hands. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have let any of you experience that. 
I'm sorry for what he said about you. It was wrong of me to put you through that. Veronica pulled my hands from my face and ran her fingers through my hair, trying to smooth it down. Don't apologize for men, Presley. It isn't our job to represent the men in our lives. They do as they want, just as we do as we want. Your father, being a horrible horse's patootie, isn't anything you're responsible for. I shouldn't have let any of you come with me. I don't know what I was thinking. He isn't a compassionate man. He will never allow me to get any kind of closure. Georgia slowed the car and reached back to pat my knee. There's a small silver lining. You showed him that you're fine. He didn't know what to do with himself when he realized that you weren't there to come crawling back to the flock. You made him stutter, Presley. You're proving him wrong. You're free from him. You're happy and thriving, and he hates it. So much so that he split my lip and probably blacked my eye. As if reading my mind, she continued, Okay, so it could have gone differently. And it could have gone better. But he's going to think about tonight for the rest of his life. He didn't break you, did he? My answer was immediate. No. A loud cheer went up in the car, but it died down quickly. Reality was darker and danker than our coaxed cheeriness in that moment. It weighed heavily on her shoulders and whispered father's cruel words into our ears, a constant reminder of the ugliness we just witnessed. It had been shocking, even to me. Seeing me in clothes that he didn't approve of, striding back into his town, not broken and alone as he predicted, but with my head held high and friends behind me, had been like pouring gasoline on a flame. Hearing my raised voice was the last draw and had incited his violence. Knowing my sisters were watching to witness had spurred him to make an example out of me. The others had been stunned silent. I'd been the one speaking, attempting to intervene on behalf of my friends. I wanted to beg him to stop talking and just listen this time. It'd been a suicide mission from the start, I knew now. Thinking I could take on father and show him that I was doing well and then stroll out of Mackin's Edge like some sort of caped superhero? It was insanity. My own sisters had looked down their noses judgmentally while I was being protected and backed up by women who'd only recently met me. They owed me no familial loyalty, yet they'd given me backup, helped me stand up against father's venom. Even Ophelia, who had every right to dislike me, was there. I think her wild growling actually frightened father, allowing me to get my wits about me enough to finally throw in the towel and retreat. A man like father would never accept an alternate view that clashed with his own narrow-minded doctrine. I'd stopped Ophelia from going after him. Not for his sake, but for hers. I didn't think that her immortal soul was damned, as father had put it. I worried that murder might tarnish it a bit. Sam is going to freak out, Ophelia voiced what I'd been thinking. All of them are going to freak out. I almost wish we could hide it somehow, but thanks to father's smiting hand, we're busted as soon as they see you, Presley. We're going to have five majorly pissed off bears on our hands, and it's going to be a chore to try to stop them from going back to Mackin's Edge. I sat up suddenly. We have to. I don't want any more of my new friends to have to experience that. I can't stomach knowing that I caused it. You didn't cause it, honey. Allie kept my cheek in her hand and frowned. None of this is your fault. It didn't feel that way, though. I was miserable. I dragged them into a bad situation that could cause their mates to enter into an even worse situation. We're going to head to the bar, and we'll try to handle the men as a group. We can get them under control. Hopefully. Georgia rolled her window down, and the rushing wind still couldn't hide her sigh. We were in a mess of trouble. I almost felt like hiding, but I knew it wouldn't help. I had to face Sam, head on, and let him see what he was getting himself into. Chapter 23 Presley We piled out of the car to head into the cave. 
I led the charge for the simple reason that I felt like I needed to take control. It was my mess. I pushed open the bar door, and the first thing my eyes landed on shifted the earth beneath my feet. Suddenly, my whole world crumbled. Sam was standing a few feet away with a woman's arms and legs wrapped around his body and her undulating hips wiggling against his groin. When he heard me suck in a sharp breath, he jerked his head in my direction. Georgia bumped into me because I'd stopped dead in the doorway. My mate had another woman in his arms. Kyle all over again. I spun around and met Georgia's eyes. Too perfect to be true. Don't let him follow me, please. As my heart shattered into a million pieces, I ran out of the bar and down the street to my house. I stopped inside only long enough to get my truck keys and then I was off, flying down the road away from Burden, Texas as fast as Bessie would take me. I fought hard against the tears that threatened to fall. I didn't know where I was going or what I was going to do when I got there. I didn't have much money and I had no one else to go to. Outside of Burden, I was officially alone. My sisters had turned their back on me, and I was as good as dead to father and his flock. It was humbling, knowing how few people I had in the world. I felt more alone than I had before I had arrived in Burden. I knew that there were people I could go to. Matt, Georgia, Allie, and the girls would provide a shoulder to cry on in a second. But they weren't Sam. I wouldn't have believed he would do such a thing, yet I couldn't get the image of the woman in his arms out of my head. Her legs had been wrapped around his waist and her arms were around his neck in a familiar way. I knew without a doubt that they'd been intimate. I didn't even hang on to Sam like that. Not yet. Not ever, now. That woman, whoever she was, was more familiar with my mate than I was. A small sign pointed left and directed me towards Big Bend. Being raised around the huge park, I knew some things about it. Enough to know that it was dangerous at night if you didn't know exactly where you were going. I took the unfamiliar road anyway. Speeding down the unlit road in the darkness, I could only see a few feet in front of me to determine where I was going. I fumbled at the radio dial until a loud country music song filled the truck. It was a haunting song about raindrops and tears of sorrow. Steering one-handed, I fumbled again for the dial, desperate to change the station. I looked up just as a huge dark shadow stumbled into the road in front of me. I slammed on the brakes and jerked the wheel to the side to avoid hitting whatever it was. I lost control of Bessie and barely managed to stop her inches before she would have slammed headfirst into a tree. I sat for a second, took a huge, calming breath, and put her into reverse to maneuver her back and get the headlights pointed in the direction of the shadowy figure. It staggered towards me, and now illuminated, I was able to make out the shape of a grizzly. One paw was clasped over its chest before it went down on all fours. The look in its eyes as it searched for the driver of the truck was too human, too intelligent for me to accept that it was just a bear, now that I knew about shifters. I opened the truck door and stepped out. Are you... are you a shifter? As crazy as I felt asking the question, I felt even crazier when the bear nodded at me. I was talking to a grizzly bear. It was answering. I knew it wasn't Sam because this bear was darker in color, and its eyes were the palest green I'd ever seen. It may have been one of his friends, though. What can I do to help? As the bear staggered closer, through its matted fur, I could see blood oozing from its chest. I jumped into action right away, feeling like I was going to throw up, but knowing that I had to help. Can you make it to the back of my truck? I know a vet. He's a shifter, too. He'll know what to do. The bear swayed, and I stupidly wedged my 140-pound body against its 400-pound frame, thinking I might help prop it up. Duh. I stayed there, though, glued to its side until we got to the rear of my truck. When I dropped the tailgate, it slowly, laboriously hoisted itself up, until it lay immobile across the bed. I pushed and pulled at the bear's back feet, trying to get them in, 
but it had evidently lost consciousness because it didn't respond to my prodding. Finally, I was able to move its feet enough to slam the gate closed before getting back into the cab of the truck. My hands shook as I looked around the cab for something to use to wipe the blood off them. In the end, I had to settle for wiping them on my jeans. I slid open the back window so I could call to the animal as I sped back toward Burden. Just hold on, okay? You'll be as good as new in no time. I prayed it wasn't dead. The tires squealed as I turned and flew down Matt's driveway, laying on the horn the whole way. When he stumbled out, rubbing sleep from his eyes, I hollered out the window for him to meet me at the clinic. I prayed as hard as I ever had for the shifter in the back of my truck. I didn't know who it was, but I desperately wanted them to live. Matt pulled into the clinic parking lot, only seconds behind me, and rushed to my side as I jumped out. What in holy hell is going on? I ran to the back of the truck and opened the tailgate. I found it on the road towards Big Bend. I think... I think it's been shot. It's a shifter, Matt. Can you help? Matt stood there, motionless, staring down at the bear in front of us with wide eyes and a slack mouth. He stood frozen like that for several seconds, until the bear chuffed in pain. The sound jettisoned him into action. Go get the cart. I snatched his keys from him and ran for all I was worth. Forgetting about my own problems for the moment, I focused on helping Matt save the bear. With great effort, we were able to slide the cart inch by inch under the bear and finally get him out of the truck and into the clinic. Matt knelt on the floor beside him and worked at examining the gunshot wound. He quickly concurred that it was the result of a bullet hole and gently and carefully dug at the wound until he located and removed the small piece of metal. By the time he was hooking the bear up to an IV and working at cleaning and dressing the wound, he had calmed considerably. What's the prognosis? Matt looked up at me startled, like he hadn't realized I was in the room. What? The shifter. Will he be okay? His eyes went back to the bear and he nodded. He'll be fine. Shifters heal faster than humans. This injury will surely keep him down for a while, but as soon as I got the bullet out, I noticed his tissues were already starting to mend themselves. I'm going to stay by his side. If he makes it through tonight, he'll be fine, for sure. I nodded. Do you know him? Matt shook his head, his eyes never leaving the large creature. No. The front door to the clinic burst open and Georgia and Allie stumbled in. Matt growled viciously and put himself between them and the injured bear. When he saw it was just the girls, his growl turned considerably less menacing, and he turned his back to them. Sam is heading to Mackin's Edge, Presley. My heart stopped for what felt like the hundredth time that day. What? Allie stepped forward. He made us tell him what happened. He was so angry that he wouldn't listen to reason. We all tried to stop him, but... He's got it out for your dad, Press. He just jumped in his truck and headed towards Mackin's Edge. Georgia nodded. And that bitch Kelly, who was all over him, honey? The guy has all said the same thing. She jumped on him unprovoked. He was prying her off when you walked in. He didn't do anything wrong, honey. None of it mattered if he got himself killed while trying to confront father. I couldn't get the image of a bear bleeding from a gunshot wound to the chest out of my head, but this time, in the image, the bear was Sam. Feeling wild with fear, I ran out of the clinic and jumped into Bessie. Heading to Mackin's Edge for the second time that night, I prayed for a better result this time. Chapter 24 Presley I hadn't even realized that Georgia and Allie had followed me until I slammed Bessie into park beside Sam's truck and ran towards the sounds of shouting. The girls fell in behind me as I ran, and as we turned the corner around my family's home and caught sight of the scene before us, we all froze. Six large, snarling grizzly bears were circling father, growling and pawing the ground like they were ready to attack. I recognized Sam's bear immediately. I had to put a stop to this madness. Presley, what are you doing? One of my sisters screamed from the safety of the porch. I ignored her and kept walking until I was inside the ring of bears and stood facing Sam. 
What are you doing? His big eyes moved over my face and he threw his head back and roared into the sky. I put my hands on my hips. It has been a trying and exhausting night. One of the longest nights of my life. I feel a migraine coming on. I cannot watch you eat, father. I'm pretty sure he would taste bitter and vile anyway. Can we please, pretty please, drop this and call it a night? Georgia laughed softly behind me. Presley wore her Wonder Woman britches tonight, huh? Father looked up at me from his spot in the ground and whimpered. What's happening, Presley? I glared down at him. It's the end of times, father, you mean old coot. This is my bear. He will eat you, vile taste or not, if you ever lay a hand on me again. Father shook. What is this? What did you do? I rolled my eyes. It felt so good I did it twice. I've been frightened of you my entire life. My larger-than-life father, fearless leader of his flock. Now it just seems ludicrous. You're nothing but a cruel, hateful, pathetic old man who exploits people's insecurities and weaknesses. Don't worry about ever seeing my face again. I'll never set foot in Mackin's Edge again so long as I live. This was all the closure I needed. I'm done. Sam nudged me with his wet nose and whined. He was sniffing my blood-speared jeans. I looked down at him and sighed. The night still wasn't over. All right, everyone. Go home. Show's over. I gently grabbed a handful of Sam's fur and pulled him away from Father, who I was pretty sure had peed himself. Not satisfied to just turn and leave, Sam leaned over Father's face and growled one more time. He was inches from Father's nose. Spittle splashed his face and rolled down his chin. Father began sobbing, covering his face with his hands. That would be the mental image I would carry of the man who had frightened and shamed me my whole life. The bears were naked men as soon as we turned the corner. Sterling took a giggling Ophelia into his arms, and then they were off, doing God knew what. Well, we all knew what. The rest of them piled into vehicles. With a simple nod towards Sam, Wyatt lifted Georgia into Sam's truck and seated himself on the driver's side. Before I fully understood what had transpired, Wyatt, Georgia, and the rest of the gang were gone, leaving Sam and me standing next to Bessie. I put the truck between us and stared at him over the hood. He was beautiful in the moonlight, and I was struggling to remember what I was upset about. His eyes trailed down my body, and he tipped his head back as he inhaled. What happened? I smell Matt and someone else on you. Blood. Talk. I gave him a growl of my own, a wholly human one, and climbed into the truck, figuring he would get in. I didn't want to spend one more second in Mackin's Edge. He got in and slammed his door shut. What happened, Presley? Talk to me. Right now. I drove back towards the clinic at a slower pace and tried to calm my racing heart. Being so close to Sam while I was still angry with him was causing a strange reaction in my body. I wanted things that I had no business wanting at the moment. After I saw you with that woman all over you, I went for a drive. I didn't want to admit to him that I'd been running away blindly. I'd found my pride tonight and it was screaming at me to be strong. A bear fell into the road. It was a shifter. He was injured. I took him to Matt and we worked in fixing him up. I'm going to go back there now to make sure Matt's okay alone with him. He'd been shot in the chest. The bear, I mean. You got out of the truck alone with a strange injured bear shifter. That's what I said. Presley, you could have been seriously hurt. When bears are injured, they can be feral. Jesus, you could have been killed. Well, I wasn't. Thank goodness. As for Kelly, I didn't. Kelly? I knew you'd been with her. The words flew out before I could stop them. Presley, I didn't do anything, I promise you. She jumped on me while I was leaving to find you. When you walked in, I was pulling her off me to tell her that I was happily taken for the rest of my life. But you've been intimate with her before. He sighed. If you want to call it that, yes. A while ago, before I knew you, Presley. 
I've been patiently waiting for you to learn to trust me, but I'm at my wit's end right now. You smell like other men, you're covered in blood, you have a black eye and a swollen lip, and all I want to do is drag you back to my house and hold you and comfort you. And make sure you're okay, but you're pissed off about something that isn't real. I want you. I also desperately want you to believe in me. That means I'm yours. You're mine. We're together no matter what. There's no one else for either of us. Get it through your head, Presley. I love you. No way would I throw this away for some random bar hoe. There's only you for me. I slammed on the brakes and turned to face him. What did you say? He threw his hands up. I said that I desperately want you to realize that I'm not... Not that. You said you love me. Oh. He stopped for a second and then nodded. Yes, I do. I love you. I went out today and looked at land. I found a place and made an offer. I figured you could sit down with an architect and design your dream house. Whatever you want, I'll buy it for you. I want you forever. I wiggled in excitement and squeaked when Bessie accelerated. I pulled over, braked, and put her in park. You found land for us. He nodded and reached out. He was still naked, a fact that I hadn't missed, but it didn't stop him from dragging me into his lap. Yes. We're doing this. Are you ready? The tears that I'd held back all night finally started to fall. Not at all. But I don't think you're concerned about whether I'm ready or not. He laughed and brushed my hair out of my face. I'll drag you along if I have to. This is meant to be and we're doing it. When I saw you tonight... When I saw your injured face, I forgot that there was even a woman latching herself onto me. The fact that someone had hurt you sent me into a tailspin. I was going to kill him, Presley. I rested my head on his shoulder. I'm glad you didn't. The last thing Mackenzie needs is a martyr. He kissed the side of my head. Is that the only reason you wanted to save him? I sighed. He's awful, Sam, but he's still my father and he's a human being. I don't want to see him again, but I feel better after tonight. That's all I needed. I could feel the shift in power tonight. I held the cards, and he would have agreed to anything to avoid being eaten by bears. You are powerful. You're a strong and powerful mate. I didn't want his death on your conscience either. He tucked his finger under my chin and lifted my face to his. As long as I protect you, my conscience is clear. I kissed him and then pulled back. We're not done talking about that woman. He growled and kissed me harder. We really are. Chapter 25 Sam Where are you going? I called to Presley as she slid from under the sheets. Mind your own business, Bear. She giggled as she danced into the kitchen. I stretched and sat up, scooting higher in the bed until I was sitting against the headboard. My little mate was blossoming more and more every day. She'd gotten feistier, and everything snarky she said to me got my dick hard. I loved watching her find her own way. It was a beautiful thing. I was ready for us to have a house built, though. I didn't want any more my house, your house. I wanted our house and our things. I jumped ahead first into being mates, and I was ready for everything that came with it. Marriage, if she wanted. Babies, all of it. Presley appeared in the doorway, wearing nothing and holding a can of whipped cream. I have an idea. I choked on my spit and tripped over the sheet in my rush to get out of bed and to her. Making a fool of myself, I sat on the end of the bed and stared at her. What is it? She was giggling, her cheeks red. I want to see if you taste good with whipped cream. Stand up. I did as she said. Press. She sauntered over to me and sprayed a drop of whipped cream onto my chest using her tongue to lick it off. She moaned and nodded to herself. Mmm, delicious. 
I tried to kiss her, but she spun away from my kiss and wagged her finger at me. It's my turn to be in control, Sam. You've been spoiling me and not asking for anything in return. She sprayed another dot on my nipple and licked it clean with long, slow strokes. I owe you a lot. You've helped me learn to trust. And I do trust you, Sam. Completely. You helped me get over issues that I didn't even know I had. You've made exploring my sexuality amazing and safe. There's something I realized that we haven't done, though. I was having a hard time understanding what she was saying with her mouth full of whipped cream. She was looking off my abs. What? She grinned up at me as she sank to her knees in front of me. I've never done this, so I'm sorry if I'm not very good. With that proclamation, she sprayed a long line of cream along my dick, and then took me into her mouth, cleaning me with her tongue as she went. I swore loudly and locked my hands behind my head to keep from grabbing her hair. I didn't have to, though, because Presley moved her lips and tongue over me seductively, licking me like I was an ice cream cone. Then she sucked hard as she popped her lips off me before taking me back into her mouth even deeper than before. Fuck, Presley. My muscles strained as she tortured me with long, slow strokes and then fast and short ones. When she took just the head into her mouth and stroked the rest of my dick with her hands, I nearly lost it. She looked up at me with wildly seductive eyes and I lost control. I pulled her off me and sank to my knees in front of her, ignoring her protest to let her finish. I flipped her around and put her on her hands and knees. Without thinking, I slapped her ass hard before sliding into her wet core. Fuck, you feel so good around me, baby. She moaned and arched her back. I wanted to finish you the other way. I thrust into her harder. Later. I need to be in you right now. She moaned as I slapped her ass again. Sam, you feel so good. I dangled my hand in her hair and held on while I fucked her in hard, fast strokes. I wasn't going to last long. Her body was already tightening around me and I could feel myself on the edge. She pushed her body back into mine and cried out my name over and over until she shook. Sam, I love you. I froze and growled as my own orgasm was ripped out of me. I sank my teeth in her neck, tasting our mark, reveling in it as I came over her. I love you, baby. Another few cans of whipped cream later, and we were both exhausted. Resting together on the bathroom floor, I cupped her ass in my hands and groaned. She was perfect. Every part of her felt like heaven. This is never going to get old. She turned on her side and looked down at me. Right? I grinned at her. Not possible. We're going to be significantly less productive for the rest of our lives because of our need for lots of together time. But it will never get old. She traced the skin around my nipple and blushed. I can't wait to design the house. I know how to have electricity turned on now, you know? I laughed. You're going to be doing a lot more than that. You're in charge of everything. We're going into a dry season, so I'm going to be busy with work. That means you choose what you want. I'll just move in when you're finished. She pressed a kiss to my chest and rested her head there. What if I want a pink kitchen? I grimaced. I'll deal with it. And a pink bedroom? You wouldn't. And a pink bathroom. And pink walls in the living room. No TVs. And... I grabbed her and dragged her on top of me. You're trying to make me spank you, aren't you? She grinned. I hope so. Heaven. I'd found heaven. The End This has been Sam, Bears of Burden, Book 5. Written by Candace Ayers. Narrated by R.J. Crichton. Copyright 2017 by Lovestruck Romance Publishing. Production copyright by Lovestruck Romance Publishing.